Okay, so welcome everyone to um, the 24th lecture of Dr. Hailey, step one. Before we begin, I just wanted to know, can everyone hear my voice clearly? Okay, good. Okay, how is everyone doing? Hope every one of you is doing really well. Um, that is good to know. Okay, good. So um, for uh, this week of lectures, we have been focusing on finishing neurology. Uh, we have come quite a far, but there are some more um, complicated topics which we have to cover and discuss before we successfully finish neurology. Uh, our main goal for this week was to complete the whole chapter, but um, given the uh, complexity and uh, the difficulty level, of uh, the chapter, we have had to take extra time to realize that uh, we have discussed every little details, number one, number two, to make sure that every one of our students have had the ability to review and recall all the text with absolute confidence. And um, also at the same time, talk about the UWorld questions and the UWorld notes. And having said that, uh, even if we uh, unfortunately fail to complete neurology by this week, uh, hopefully by the starting of the next week around um, uh, with an extra of two classes on uh, from Monday to Wednesday, uh, from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, two to three classes, uh, hopefully we can finish the whole chapter and that will be a great victory for all of us, okay? And uh, having said that, um, first of all, I would like to know, um, how was your uh, UWorld solving for yesterday from everyone, if possible? How did, how did your uh, UWorld solving go yesterday? Could I get some answers from everyone, please? Can you please answer my question? I guess we have a question from Dr. Maheshwari. Uh, she wants to know if you can sit for step one after completing second year or th third year of MBBS for an IMG. Okay, so that's a good question and I will come to that. Before I come to that question, I would like to know how is your UWorld solving going? And um, okay, is it possible to get some feedback from everyone so that we, so that we understand um, how everyone is doing with their UWorld? Okay, so first of all, I would like to know how many questions were done successfully yesterday. And second of all, I would like to know how many questions did you guys find in common uh, to our discussions yesterday, okay? So can I get some answers, please? First of all, how many questions did you guys do yesterday successfully? And how many questions did you guys find similar or common to our discussions? Okay, five questions, okay, so, okay, good. Okay, so five is, um, okay. 30 questions and 35 were common with Dr. Hassam. Okay, that's great, thank you. And who else? Please, if I do not get answers, then I would have to understand that none of you have done your questions except the ones who have answered. Okay, good. Who else? Who else have been doing UWorld questions? Okay, 25, that's, that, that's good. What else? 10, okay, 40. Okay, for the purpose of the new students, I mean, for the purpose of the students who have just joined the lectures, all I wanted to know was how many questions did you guys do last, yesterday? Okay. Okay, Dr. Rasam, that is extremely clear. So as for you, you have been uh, solving you all, you have been solving offline questions for approximately, uh, okay, and 70% of your questions are done. Okay. And now um, passing first day with you. Okay, so any advice on how to study now? Okay, 
So um, the same advice is my advice will always be the same. Okay. After we are done with the uh, after we are done with the discussion, you have to do your regular UL questions at least one month. Okay. So if you if you guys are doing close to thirty to forty questions, then you guys are on the right path. Okay. This will allow you guys to enter the, de the dedicated period very effectively. Okay. Anywhere from uh, thirty to forty questions is absolutely perfect. Okay. Okay, so uh, if you are solving U World offline, that is okay too. Okay, so and uh, the next question is how many questions uh, or are you guys finding the questions in common to our discussions, um, the discussions that we are doing during our lectures, and also uh, the discussion that we are doing after the lectures. Uh, we are trying to solve U World uh, difficult topics. Uh, I am trying to let you know exactly what you have to, uh, what you can expect. Okay, so they are common. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. So then uh, I would like to believe that uh, we are on the right path. Okay. Okay. All right. And uh, to answer another student's questions about uh, if you can give your exam after the second or third years after you complete your bachelor's of medicine and bachelor's of surgery and regarding step one and my answer is yes. Okay. If you are done with your first and uh, second year and you have successfully completed um, anatomy, physiology, um, biochemistry, pathology, microbiology, and um, what else? And um, so if you have uh, completed these topics in your uh, bachelor's and if you have received your passing grade in uh, these topics, in, once again, in your bachelor's, then you are eligible to sit for your step one, okay? So I hope that answers your question, Dr. Maheshwari. Okay, okay. So if you have a problem in uh, uh, recalling the material, the best way that you can uh, solidify that that uh, information is once you start applying that knowledge. The best, uh, the best way to start applying the knowledge is to do questions, more and more questions, okay? So that's what it is, okay, let's go. Okay, so we have another question from Dr. Hassan. If what if she has to do BNB videos along with our lectures? Okay, and uh, the thing is, um, okay, to answer your question, Dr. Hassan, if you are thinking about doing BNB videos along with our uh, resources, um, the thing is, it's absolutely uh, so it's absolutely your choice. But we think it's not necessary. I'm going to tell you why, because the whole goal of our lectures and the whole goal of BNB is basically the same thing to make sure that um, your knowledge about first aid is incorporated in your mind. OK, so uh, to be honest, if you are confident enough to read first aid by yourself and understand first aid by yourself, you, you, do, not, you do not even need Dr. Hydley's step one lectures or you won't even need BNB videos, okay? So if, if you are confident to read first aid by yourself, then you really do not need us and you really do not need any other resources, okay? So uh, what I believe is uh, the fewer resources, the better, okay? Because if you have a lot of resources that would uh, take up a lot of your day and it would take away the whole purpose of your uh, preparation, which is uh, you, your time needed to solve questions because uh, I would advise everyone to solve questions from UWorld if needed, uh, solve more questions from MBOSS instead of using resources to learn first aid. If you are already um, doing first aid with us, then we are already a resource for you where we learn the first aid and we explain everything in details. So uh, we really feel that there's absolutely no need for you to, uh, um, for you to use another resource uh, to solidify the information in first aid because uh, you are already doing that with us. Having said that, um, if you believe that uh, there's something else that you need to do and you have the proper time in the day to uh, allot uh, to that resource, then you are more than welcome to do so. Okay, but um, that the whole point is uh, the whole point of our lecture is that we give all the information from UWorld, Pathoma, and um, Firecracker. Okay, so what we do is a Firecracker contains information from, uh, let's say, it contains information from Robbins pathology from Golian's physiology. Okay, then it contains information from Lange's microbiology and we use everything in our, in, in, in our uh, lectures. And the way that happens is the day before uh, we, um, 
the day before we begin, we per, we prepare our lectures accordingly. So although you guys cannot see it, that uh, the use of Firecracker during the lecture, we are already providing notes and information from the Firecracker, which are a bit different to you so that your first day turns into one solid book, okay? So that in your last days of studies, this could be one book which you can read over and over again with all the informations in it so that your um, time could be uh, saved, okay? And the rest of your days could be dedicated to doing questions. Okay, so hope that answers your question, Dr. Hassan. Okay, no problem. Uh, do we need to read the Pathoma text or video is enough? Okay, so uh, that's a very common question about Pathoma. So uh, the thing is Pathoma is important because Pathoma contains, uh, Pathoma contains breakdown of the pathology explained exceptionally by uh, Dr. Hussein Esata, okay? And his explanations are extremely important. And um, uh, so what we believe is that the videos created by uh, Dr. Sotar is um, more uh, valuable than the text, because if you read the text all by itself, uh, the you, uh, it, 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 it will not make as much sense because he uses, um, he uses uh, white pages to uh, explain everything. So uh, we would suggest that you read that, that you watch the videos over and over again instead of reading the text. Okay, so hope that answers your question. Next one, how to have grip on CTs, MRI scans, and pictures? That's a good question. And we will have classes on CTs, MRI scans, and pictures, and we will explain everything on how, how to read C CT scans, on how to uh, address questions from CT scans and uh, MRIs and x-rays. Okay, so. Uh, leave that up to us and we will prepare you accordingly okay next question are midbrain pons medulla structure high yield yes midbrain pons medulla and uh, basically the structures of the brain stem are extremely important especially uh, specifically and especially the drawing diagram which we did yesterday where the nerves are arising from the from the structures uh, okay that is extremely important okay so uh, that that diagram is extremely important, and you will receive an abundance amount of amount of questions from brainstem regarding that diagram. Okay, so hope that answers your question. Next one, uh, I have six hour study. I'm doing the lectures from nine to one, and uh, from seven to nine, I'm doing you will. Is that enough? Okay, okay. So that's a good question. Once again, uh, so all together you have a six hour study period. Hope uh, so. Nine to one is four hours with us, four to five hours with us. And from seven to nine, it's close to around, um, let's say it's around two hours. So that's six, six hours of study. That, that's a decent amount of study. Okay, that's not a problem. But uh, if you keep on studying like this, hopefully uh, you can enter your dedicated period or in around, in around uh, let's say, uh, no less than six months. Okay, six months, six to six and a half months, depending on how fast uh, you can uh, do the questions in two hours. Okay, so in two hours, you, uh, you can do around let's say 20 questions or 25 questions, okay? And if you keep on doing that, uh, you can solve uh, the questions in um, 200 days, okay? Hopefully, so 200 days is basically your, um, 200 days are, um, let's say how much, you know, six, six threes are 18, 180, close to around six to six and a half months, so that's it. So that's exactly what it is, that's the breakdown. So if you are studying exactly six hours every day, um, so if you are consistent, you can enter your dedicated period in six to six, six to six and a half months. Okay, so yes, that is enough. If, if your goal is to enter the, the dedicated period in six to six and a half months, then that is enough. If your goal is to enter the dedicated period in less than six to six and a half months, then unfortunately you have to study a bit more, okay? Next one, can we use uh, offline UWorld or is that good enough? Okay, our advice is to start UWorld online as soon as possible, but we know how uh, hard um, and difficult it is for some medical students to purchase it, uh, it online because it could be a bit expensive. Okay, so our so for the students who uh, for whom um, that is a struggle, they can do UWorld offline first and then begin with UWorld online. For students who uh, for 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 students for whom uh, purchasing UWorld online is not a struggle, I would advise you guys to start UWorld online as soon as possible. Okay, I, I would advise you guys to start UWorld online as soon as possible. Okay, because there's um, because if you guys can't do that, there's no point because. Um, 
already UWorld Online has around 3,300 questions. And then if you do offline UWorld, that's another 2,000 questions. And then you have to do the online again. And that adds up to around 5,000 questions. And that would take up a lot of time. Okay. Okay. So a lot of discussion has been done regarding uh, the exam. Okay. Can we do, uh, can we start our, our discussion on the previous topic? Is everyone ready? Okay. Okay, before we begin, any more last question regarding the exam? Okay, no, no more questions. Okay. Okay, so uh, let, let's begin. Okay. So uh, first of all, what is the cerebral perfusion pressure dependent upon? Partial pressure of carbon dioxide or partial pressure of um, partial pressure of uh, oxygen? Okay, one second. Okay, good. Okay, next one. Next one is um, I would like to share my screen right away and start with. Um, Okay, I would like to share my screen right away and start with uh, assessing you guys, whether you guys have learned um, the homunculus and uh, all those things. Okay, give me one second. Okay, so can you guys see my screen over here? Okay, so can you guys um, hear my voice, first of all? Okay, good. And now, uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay, good. Okay, so first of all, our first question was, uh, what, is what is the cerebral perfusion pressure dependent on? And your answer was um, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Okay, and this is a very rough drawing of, let's say, okay, let's say the brain. Okay, this is the motor, this is the sensory. Okay. Uh, okay, so once again, if, uh, if you have decreased blood supply to this part of the, to this part of the cerebral hemisphere, which part of your body is most likely to be involved or be weakened or paralyzed? Okay, good. Lower extremities. How about here? Upper extremities. How about here? Head and face. Okay, so head and face, that's very good. Okay. Okay, next one. Okay, so um, that, that is very good. Okay, next one. Next one is what is the blood supply of the brain? What is the blood supply of the brain in this region? What is the blood supply of the brain in this region? Middle cerebral artery. Uh, what, uh, where does uh, the middle cerebral artery comes from? From which artery? Internal carotids. Okay, next question. Next question is a very short drawing. Okay, once again. Okay, we're trying to draw the circle of Willis. Which two arteries are the first one to arise? What, what are these arteries? Vertebral arteries. They, these two join and forms what? Basilar artery. Very good. And they bifurcate and they form what? Okay. PCA. Okay. And then we. And then what is the name of this artery? ASA. Anterior spinal artery. Okay. And then we have. We have these one two three what is the name of these from the cerebrum or the cerebellum okay good so superior superior cerebellar anterior inferior cerebellar and posterior inferior cerebellar okay good and then we have also had some small ones over here these are the pontine arteries so that, that's 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 no question 
Okay, next one is um, if you have an RD over here and these are giving off to one and two. Okay, what is the name of this artery? MCA. What is the name of this artery, this one? ACA. And then you join, that's anterior communicating and posterior communicating. And these ones have uh, these branches over here and these are known as lenticular stride or lateral stride branches. Okay, good, okay, okay. Where do the dural venous sinuses drain in? Where do the dural venous sinuses drain in? The drainage, the main drainage of the dural venous sinuses of all the sinus, superior sagittal, uh, inferior sagittal, transverse sinuses, and all of them drain in which vein? Internal jugular vein, okay. Internal jugular vein, okay. Okay. Okay, next one. Next one is, uh, you have, first of all, where is the CSF formed? CSF, where is this formed? Choroid plexus, and which cells are involved with the formation of the choroid plexus? Choroid plexus, okay, specialized ependymal cells. And then uh, the next one is, um, uh, where do they go from the choroid plexus? Lateral ventricles. And from the lateral ventricles, where do they go? Third. From the third, they go to where? Fourth. From the fourth, they are they are gone to subarachnoid space, and from there, they are absorbed by the arachnoid um, granulations. Okay, they are they are absorbed by the arachnoid granulations. Okay, okay, one second. Okay. So that is very good. Uh, very close, okay. Okay, now we will be talking about the structures of the brainstem, once again, okay. We will be talking about the structures of the brainstem. Okay. Okay, so what's going on over here? First of all, what is the name of um, what what is the name of this uh, nerve, this cranial nerve? CN one. Okay, what is the name of this cranial nerve? Okay, optic nerve. That is very good. Okay, next one. Next one is, this is pons. Okay. This is the pons, and we talked about um, we talked about this one and this one. Okay. What are the names of these are uh, these nerves? Oculomotor and. Okay, very good, guys. Okay, that is very good. Okay, and now then we talked about, um, okay, we talked about, and then I'm just gonna draw this really quick. Okay, this looks very weird. What are the names of uh, these? What are the names of, of these ones? Very roughly drawn. Exactly, it's six, it's not five, okay? I didn't even draw, I did, I did not draw five. Five should have been like this. Okay, so, so this is five, this is six, and then we have seven, then we have eight, okay? And then the rest ones just keep on following like this. Okay, six, seven, eight, and then we have the rest of the ones. Okay, so we're, so you, you guys get the idea of the brainstem, right? So next time, if you guys receive questions from brainstem, will you guys be confident or not? Please be confident and confident that please answer the right question. Uh, right answer, okay? So they will ask you whether you can identify the nerves. And uh, let's say they can uh, ask you to identify a specific nerve, okay? 
And let me just show you very quick how the questions will come. Okay, how the questions will come. So let me just, just give me one second. Okay. Okay. One second. Okay, so my question is, which one of these following labels are destroyed? Which one of these following labels are destroyed when the patient, um, which one of these following labels are destroyed in Kalman syndrome, let's say Kalman syndrome. Okay, so think about it for a minute. Which one of these labelings are destroyed in Kalman syndrome? That's a common question. Let's see if we, got, if we have the answer. Very good, okay. Okay, good. Patient has anosmia, so olfactory. And um, A is your CN1, olfactory bulb. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so do you guys get the idea about how you guys will receive questions from uh, the brainstem? Because we had a question, we had a, we had a, we had a student who asked whether we would be receiving questions on um, the, on uh, brainstem or not and this is exactly how you will be receiving the question okay <clears throat> okay so we are very close to the end of our discussion till now you guys are doing really well okay do you guys remember the um advice given to you by your big brother to um that um that um money doesn't matter big brains matter most do you guys remember that uh, discussion? Okay, good. So can I get, uh, okay, so can, can any of you write uh, these uh, 12 mnemonics and for the 12 types of cranial nerves by mentioning S, S, M, M, B. Can I get that please from anyone? Really quick. That would may help me understand that you guys have understood the mnemonic, okay? Some say many money, but my brother says, okay, so we have as okay. So let's see. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brain matter most. Okay, so perfect. Okay, and then you just write down the numbers. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then you associate the types of the cranial nerves, okay, which are sensory, which are motor, which are both. Okay. So that's that, that's very good. Okay, next one, next one, next thing is, um, if you do a lumbar puncture and you hear the word pop, okay, which of the following, which of the structures have you uh, penetrated? Ligamentum flavum, ligamentum flavum. Okay, very good. Okay, so that is, uh, that is amazing. Okay, so for today's lecture right now, we will be starting with uh, spinal cord and it's um, associated tracks. Okay, so, so far, do we have any confusion? Okay, just give me one second before I start the lecture at 9.45. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So for today, we would be starting with spinal cord and associated tracts, okay? And if you ask me um, how important is learning spinal cord and its associated tracts, okay? So my answer is learning the spinal cord and the structures of the spinal cord is extremely important, okay? Learning about the tracts is absolute, it's, it's not absolutely important, okay? But we still have to learn it for the purpose of answering questions in the future, but it's uh, highly unlikely you will get direct questions from the spinal uh, from the spinal tracts. Okay, the reason being is because um, it's difficult to make questions uh, from the physiology of the tracts itself. So uh, 
the important thing is we have to learn the tracks and that's what we will do, okay? We will learn the tracks for the purpose of understanding the pathology uh, because the only way you can understand the pathology is if you have uh, mastered the physiology. So that's the only reason why we will uh, master uh, the tracks, okay? But if you have to uh, understand the fact that uh, you, won't, you will not be receiving a lot of question from the tracks, uh, this takes off a huge burden of, of uh, reading the tracks over and over again. Okay, so having said that, okay, let's see if everyone is uh, ready. Okay, so should we begin? Okay, good. It's 9.45 as of right now, and all the students have joined the lectures, and we can successfully begin our um, lecture for today. Once again, thank you for um, understanding the lecture of yesterday. Okay, good. So first of all, what we will be doing is we will be starting with the drawing of the spinal cord to make you guys associate. And uh, instead of me answering the uh, segments of the spinal cord, I would expect uh, the students to um, answer it by themselves because, because this is a very basic knowledge. Okay, so what I would be doing is I'll be drawing the spinal cord. Okay, see if... Uh, Okay, one second. Okay. Okay. And let's see. This is just an imaginary drawing, or I mean that imaginary line to make you understand the different segments of the spinal cord, okay? So this is basically a dry diagram of your spinal cord. Before we, before we go in depth of uh, the spinal cords, okay, I want to know your understanding of the white matter and the gray matter, okay? So uh, what is uh, what are uh, the tracts? Are the tracts white matter or are the tracts gray matter? Can I get some fast answers, please, of the white matter? And what, okay, and, okay, okay. And what are the cell bodies and nucleus? Are they white or gray matter? Gray matter, okay. So very basic knowledge, okay, a very basic knowledge. If this is the brain, okay, okay, if this is the brain, the brain has the gray matter over here, and all these parts are the white matter, okay? So peripheral gray matter, central white matter. Okay, per peripheral gray matter, central white matter for, for the brain. If it's a spinal cord, they have a central gray matter, which contains the nucleus, and you have the tracts over here. So in the spinal cord, it's the complete opposite. In the spinal cord, you have central gray matter and peripheral white matter. Do you guys want to write this down in your book, just in case uh, you guys forget this? Because... Uh, um, this is a this is a highly inform uh, this, this is a highly this is a high yield information which a lot of students uh, does not know although it sounds very easy okay but a uh, high yield information which a lot of students do not know and it's highly tested upon okay so write this down so write this down uh, first of all write write down uh, for the brain you have the peripheral gray matter and uh, you have the central white matter and for the spinal cord you have the central gray matter and the peripheral white matter. Okay, did, did you guys did you guys write this down in your book? Should we proceed forward? Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. We have had only two yeses from two physicians. Does that mean uh, the rest of the physicians did not write them down? Guys, yes, no? Okay, yes. Okay, okay, good. Okay, well, well, perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so right now what I would be expecting is I would be expecting you guys to tell me the names of the columns over here. Okay, so first of all, uh, what, uh, first of all, uh, what, what is the name of this structure over here? What is the name of this structure? Central canal. The name of the structure is central canal. And what does this central canal, uh, canal contain? What does this central canal contain? CSF. Okay, central canal contains CSF. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm not gonna write it down. Okay, and I'm gonna save some space. Okay, what is uh, the name of this column over here? What is the name of this column? Okay, easy question and easy answers only. Okay, so the, this is the dorsal column and that is easy. Okay, so this is the dorsal column, okay. 
Be very good. Okay, so what is the name of um, what is the name of this column over here? Okay. Well, what is the name of this column? So this is, so this is where the, the lateral tracks go to go through. Okay, and what is the name of this column? Anterior. Okay, so we have figured out that we have figured out the dorsal, the, the, the dorsal, lateral, and the anterior. Okay, so that's good. The, the, these are very basic, easy knowledges. Okay, that's not a problem. Can anyone tell me what is uh, the name of this column over here? Please do not look at your book to answer these questions. What is the name of these that column? What is the name of this column? intermediate column and what is uh, this column associated with autonomic nervous system this column is associated with the sympathetic part of the autonomic nervous system okay so once again dorsal lateral anterior intermediate okay okay um, and then we have this one okay this is the part of the spinal cord which is the anterior horn of the spinal cord okay so that's that okay all right okay and then this is the posterior horn obviously if this is the anterior then this is the posterior okay so that that's what it is okay so once again uh this is basically what the spinal cord is okay and um let's talk a little bit more about uh the dorsal column okay let's talk a little bit more about the dorsal column which are uh which which contains either ascending or descending which which one of the uh, tracts do they contain ascending or descending dorsal column which one of the tracts which tracks do they contain ascending or descending and the answer is absolutely ascending okay they contains ascending tracks okay so this is basically a breakdown this is basically a breakdown of the dorsal column okay so uh this is break basically a breakdown of the dorsal column and over here what i need you guys to understand that this, this is a very high yield UL question okay so i'm just going to give three stars and for students who are solving emboss okay although this is easy to remember sometimes students can mess this up Okay, so what, what, what I would like you to tell you is you have these uh, two fasciculus. Okay, so fasciculus is basically the term used for bundles of white matter or, or, to, or bundles of nerve, uh, or I mean the bundles of tracts. Okay, so fasciculus. Okay, so that, that's the name that they have used. Okay, so this part, uh, the one which is medial, okay, the one which is medial, this part is, is important for sending informations to the cortex, the cerebral cortex from the lower part of your body. Specifically, since it's the dorsal column, the information that they, they, will, be sent, they will be sending are pain, uh, are, I'm sorry, it's not pain, it's vibration, pressure, right? And then proprioception. So the dorsal column is associated with vibration, pressure, and proprioception. And the one that is closer to the, to, to the medial one is, is important for sending information from the lower extremities. And the one that is a lateral to this one is, in, is important for sending information from the upper extremities. And the names of uh, these ones are the one th uh, that sends information from the uh, lower extremities. This is known as fasciculus, gr fasciculus gracilis, okay? Fasciculus gracilis. And the word gracilis, okay? Gracilis, okay, okay? They have a huge um, L word in it. Okay, gracilis. Okay, so do not forget the association of gracilis with lower extremity. Once again, lower extremity is, uh, it sends in information from the lower extremities to the cortex, and it stays in the medial side. And the one that is lateral to this one is the, the one that sends in information from the uh, upper extremities. Okay, and that is known as that is known as fasciculus cuneatus cuneatus u4 uh, upper extremity okay so is that clear is that clear okay okay good okay so if you guys ever get confused about uh, whether gracilis is upper extremity or cuneatus is uh, upper extremity or which one is upper and which one is lower first of all when you guys play football do you, uh, do you guys play football with your hands or your legs legs very good okay brilliant brilliant answer okay 
Now the thing is, uh, do you guys play football on the grass? Yes or no? Can you guys play football on the on the grass? Okay, okay. So you guys play football on the grass. Okay, so that's what it is. So grass feelless. Okay, legs on grass. Okay, legs on grass. Gracilis. So gracilis, you, it's impossible for you to play football with your hands. And that again, to play with uh, football, to play football with your hands on the grass. Okay. So you play with your legs on the grass. You play football with your legs on the grass. So the reason why I'm emphasizing on this is because you will receive at least six questions, around six to seven questions about this in uh, some way or other um, in your uh, U world. And um, uh, most of you, uh, will answer them confidently, but there will be some of you who will get confused whether you, uh, they, this is associated with the upper extremity or this is associated with the lower extremity, okay? And so do not forget that uh, gracilis is associated with lower body and fasciculus cuneatus is associated with upper extremity, okay? Next one. Next one. Next one is uh, after we have uh, after we have done this one, let's go back to the next group of uh, ascending tracts, okay? So we have this tract over here, okay? So we have, uh, second, okay? So we have this tract over here, okay? There's another thing which I want to discuss with you guys. It's that um, if this is uh, the information which is coming from the lower extremity, this is, associate, this is associated with sacral and lumbar, and this one is associated with thoracic and cervical. Just, just in case they ask you uh, which parts of the spinal cord are uh, most innervated or which part of the spinal cord does uh, is most innervated with uh, fasciculus gracilis and the answer is um, sacral and lumbar and if they ask you which one is associated more with the upper extremity the answer is thoracic and cervical okay next one next one is um, this one over here okay so this this track over here can you guys tell me very quick okay can you guys tell me very quick the name of this tract What is the name of this tract? Last point. Last point was this one is containing info. Uh, they they innervate more the sacral. They innervate the sacral and, and lumbar more. They innervate more the thoracic and the cervical part because that's where the upper extremities are, and this is where. <coughs> excuse me. This is where you get information from the lower extremities. Okay. Okay. So. So to, to answer my next question, the name of this, this one is, you guys have answered it perfectly, and the name is lateral spinothalamic tract. And can you guys tell me really quick, uh, what, what uh, sensations do the lateral spinothalamic tract detect? Can you guys see my screen or no? Can you guys see my screen? Okay, good. Okay, perfect. So the lateral spinothalamic tract, uh, this tract detects pain and temperature, okay? This tract, it detects pain and temperature, okay? And uh, once again, this part, which is medial, contains more information from the cervical portion of the spinal cord. And this part that is more lateral contains information from the sacral portion of the spinal cord, okay? This is not heavily asked, okay? Just understanding the tracts are more are, are enough. But, it, but if they do, uh, you're not, uh, you're just your understanding of the fact that the cervical contains information, which is medial and the one that's lateral is enough, okay. And then we have this another group of small ascending tracts over here. And what is the name of this tract, please? What is the name of that tract? Anterior spinothalamic tract. And anterior spinothalamic tract, uh, the question is, uh, what sensations do they detect? Okay, crude touch and pressure, that is very good. Okay, so we have uh, learned about uh, the tracts which are ascending. The rest is now we have to learn about the tracts which are descending. Now we will learn about the descending tracts, okay? Okay, and now let's talk a little bit about the descending tracts, okay? The descending tracts are also on the lateral side. Okay, so just because we are drawing it on this side, it does not mean that they do not have the same thing on this side. Okay, so they contain both of these structures on the both side, just for, a, just for some space on the spinal cord, I'm drawing this on this side, okay. So over here on this one, uh, this is, uh, what is the name of this uh, tract over here, please? 
lateral cortical spinal cortical spinal meaning that it comes all the way from the cortex okay and then and then then it enters the spinal cord and then it goes through the muscle so that is very good and this is important for voluntary or involuntary motion and th this is a very easy question it's almost rhetorical voluntary of, of course okay so you decide to do something you send your impulses through this tract over here okay so that's uh what it is okay and um having said that let's see if we have touched everything from first aid okay okay so this diagram is a bit unclear okay but this but this is what this was more important so we have uh, all we have discussed almost everything over here okay and uh, we have just discussed about the ascending column. We have discussed about the descending columns, intermediate, intermediate horns. Okay, that's what it is. Okay. Another thing that I would like to talk about in uh, just a small amount, okay, is I would like to talk a little bit about um, the uh, autonomic nervous system. Okay, I would like to talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system uh, just uh, for a while to see how your understanding and your basic knowledge about the autonomic nervous system is, okay, because uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the bachelor's programs they do not uh, they do not focus on solidifying that information. So first of all, uh, what is the autonomic nervous system? The, it, how how many parts are there to an autonomic nervous system? Two parts. That is a very okay. Two parts. The answer to is a very common answer. Okay, but uh, it has not been true for a long time. Okay, and the answer is three. Okay, so for all the students who has answered two, uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are referring to sympathetic and parasympathetic, but uh, this, the third one is enteric. Okay, so we have parasympathetic, parasympathetic, and then we have enteric nervous system. Okay, so uh, if you guys did not know this again, I know this before, there is absolutely no problem. Okay, but knowing that there are three parts to autonomic nervous system is important. Okay, next one. Next one is if you have sympathetic and parasympathetic, can you guys tell me the um, the parts of the spinal cord which are responsible for the sympathetic uh, activity. The parts of the spinal cord which are responsible for the sympathetic activity, please. Thoracolumbar outflow. Okay, so basically what's, hap what's happening over here is that uh, you have uh, outflow or, or informations which are coming from the uh, thoracic portion of the spinal cord and the lumbar portion of the spinal cord. Okay, and what is the, okay, so that's what it is. So, when, so for example, when you uh, when when you receive a stimulus, for example, let's say it's a fight or flight stimulus, the thoracolumbar portion of the spinal cord gets activated, okay, and you have impulses which travels through the uh, intermediate horn, and then they go and they do the associated um, uh, changes, okay. That's what it is, and we will be discussing in the autonomic nervous system in details, okay, a bit later. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so once again, uh, we we're um, back to our text we are done with uh, the last page the next page that i would like to talk about okay before i jump on to there but first i would like to share some images okay okay so the first uh, thing that we would like to talk about is we have come to the tracts okay and this is the part of the first aid which i ha which i talked about before the lecture it's that uh, this is not heavily heavily asked okay although they ask you some questions, but it's extremely important for you to understand the tracks for the purpose of understanding your pathology behind the physiology. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the tracks. So first of all, we have uh, we have two tracks: ascending tracks and descending tracks. In the ascending tracks, you have the dorsal column, and uh, you have the spinal thalamic tracks. And in the lateral, and in the de descending tracks, you have the corticospinal. So meaning, in a very short term, this is the information which is coming from the periphery to the brain. And this is the information which is coming from the brain to the periphery. So first of all, let's talk about the dorsal column, okay? And we know exactly, we discussed a bit earlier how the dorsal column has fasciculus gracilis, okay, legs and grass, so for the lower extremities and fasciculus cuneatus for the upper extremities. And uh, the functions are they detect pain, uh, they detect pressure, vibration, fine touch and proprioception, okay? And now before we jump onto this, okay? Before we jump onto this, let's talk about uh, this diagram first, okay? So basically, uh, this is the diagram of the first of all of the dorsal column medial lemniscus system. Okay, so let's see what's going on over here. So first of all, you have the stimulus. So the stimulus is the fine touch proprioception sensations from, from let's say the right side of the body. Okay, so for example, for this diagram, you have the right side of the body. 
Okay, so what's going on is this information it comes and it enters the spinal cord. Do you guys realize that the first uh, thing, so the first thing that it does is it enters the dorsal root ganglion. And in dorsal root ganglions, you have a cell which is known as a pseudo unipolar cell. So pseudo unipolar. So it's actually not you. It's actually not unipolar. Okay, it's actually bipolar. Okay, bipolar meaning that the cells can transmit information from both ways. Okay. So this is pseudo, -uni pseudo unipolar, pseudo unipolar, meaning that the cells can transmit information either from uh, the periphery to the central nervous system or back from the central nervous system to the periphery, okay? So it's a pseudo unipolar cells. So what happens is they enter the dorsal root ganglion and based on uh, where the information is coming from, let's say if the information comes from the legs, they go to the fasciculus gracilis. If the information comes from the upper arm, they go to the fasciculus cuneatus, okay? So what happens is uh, they extend upwards, okay? So you, these are still segments of spinal cord. They keep on extending upwards until they reach the medulla, okay? So, so we have the brain stem in which we have the midbrain pons and the medulla. And in the medulla, you have two important nucleuses. And I told you guys that the brainstem is basically, uh, it contains more of the white matter, uh, more, more of the gray matter. And the reason for that being is, is, is because for all the nucleus which the medulla contains, okay? So in the medulla, you have um, these nucleus. So you have nucleus gracilis for fasciculus gracilis, and then you have nucleus cuneatus for nucleus cuneatus. And from the nucleus cuneatus, what they do is uh, they form another, uh, another bundle, okay? And this bundle is known as a lemniscus. Okay, this bundle is known as a lemon. So at, at first, it was known as a, as a fasciculus, and now it's known as a lemniscus. Okay, and uh, what happens is after they form the lemniscus, what's going on is, do you realize that there has been a, there has already been a decussation? Okay, so there has always, there has already been a decussation. So what happens is, they, they decussate, and meaning that they extend and then they move or they transect. So from this side, this goes all the way from this side. So this is known as a medullary decussation, medullary decussation. So if anyone asks you, uh, where, do the, um, where do the nerves from the dorsal column decussate? Do they decussate in the spinal cord or do they decussate in the medulla? And this is a very high yield question from uh, Ural. And your answer should be that they have medullary decussation, meaning that they decussate in the medulla and they extend upward and they go, go through the midbrain all the way. They go to the thalamus. And specifically, we talked about the fact that the thalamus receives information. We have the nucleus in the thalamus. Uh, can you guys tell me the name of the nucleus in the thalamus, which is involved for receiving information from the periphery of the body? Okay. VPL, that is very good. So the information is the information is VPL. The information is VPL. I mean, the nucleus is VPL, okay? And the VPL is ventral posterior lateral nucleus. And from the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, this goes, where, can anyone tell me, uh, where do they um, go from the thalamus um, before they reach the brain? Before they reach the brain, where do they go to the thalamus? Where they, do they go from the thalamus? Uh, no, they do not go to the basal ganglia or... Okay, one second, please. My question was, Okay. Okay. One second. Okay. So what? So my question was, my question was, uh, before they reach the brain, uh, before they reach the cerebral cortex. Okay. I I apologize for that short delay. Before we reach the cerebral cortex. Where do the informations grow from the thalamus before reaching the, the cerebral cortex? What is the answer? Do you guys know? Internal capsule is not the right answer. Internal capsule is responsible for sending in informations from the brain. Has anyone heard of the reticular activating system or the reticular system? 
what is the reticular system? Anyone, what is the reticular system? Okay. Okay, so what's happening is, so what's happening is, <clears throat> Okay, so over here, even before uh, reaching the thalamus, the nerves, what happens is they go all the way up over here, over here, over here, and even before they reach the brain, they reach a center, which is known as the reticular activating system. So uh, the, my, my question was a bit confusing. So my question was, do they receive, uh, do they go to any other structures from the thalamus to, to the brain? Your answer should have been no, they go directly to the brain, that's number one. And <clears throat> another one is, um, uh, the reticular system, the reticular system is basically this collection of white matter. Okay, so what is the reticular system? If anyone asks you, the reticular system is basically this collection of white matter, which contains all the informations from uh, that is coming or going through the or from the spinal cord. And then the information from the reticular system goes either to the thalamus or the hypothalamus and from the thalamus, they go to the brain. Okay, so the pathology behind that question is if you have damage of the reticular activating system, can you name a condition of the, can you name the condition which the patient will experience if there is damage of the reticular activating system? Okay, so my, the whole point of this, this discussion is to, is to make you guys come to this uh, question. Is this because it's a high yield question from Amboss? Okay, so that's what I was looking for, the question. Okay, that was the reason for the delay. And uh, what is the name of the condition if the patient has a problem with the reticular activating system? And the name of the condition is coma. Okay, the name of the condition is coma. Okay, so patients who are comatose, unconscious, absolutely unconscious or comatose patients have damage to the reticular activating system. Is that, is, is that clear? Is that clear, yes or no? Because if you have damage to the reticular activating system, okay, if you have damage to the reticular activating system, then, it, then none of the information from the brain will go to the spinal cord and none of the information from the spinal cord will come to the brain and uh, there will be absolutely no changes in the brain at all. So this is known as, this is what happens in a patient who has coma, okay? So now do you guys understand? What is the condition of the patient who has damage, who has damaged reticular system? What is the condition of the patient who has damage to the reticular activating system? Okay, that is the question. And the answer is the condition is the comatose condition or coma. Are we clear? Are we clear? If anyone's solving AMBOSS, if anyone's solving AMBOSS, they will receive this question. Once again, for students who have not understood reticular activating system, I will come and uh, break this down to you from the get-go. Okay, first of all, let's talk about this. You have all this information coming over here, then they do the medullary decussations, and then they enter the midbrain. And even before they enter the thalamus, they have this small group of white matters over here, okay? And this group of white matters is known as reticular activating system. What are the pathways that contains, uh, which that the reticular activating system contains? And the answer is it contains all the pathways. The pathways which are coming from the brain, meaning the cortical spinal, and the pathways which are coming from the spinal to the brain, meaning the spinal cortical or the spinal, spinal thalamic tracts, okay? So they contain all the pathways. So if you have, uh, let's say ischemia or damage or trauma to the reticular activating system, Okay, the patients will be comatosed. Okay, the, the patients will be comatosed. Why? Because none of the information from the brain will go to the uh, will go to the periphery, and none of the information from the periphery will, will go to the brain. Have you guys seen a comatose patient? Have you guys ever dealt with a comatose patient? Okay, okay. So if you guys have not dealt with a comatose patient, have you guys seen coma patients in movies? Yes. Okay. Good. So the thing is, do you do you uh, do you can you is it possible for you guys to talk to comatose patients, or uh, expect answers from comatose patients? Absolutely not. Okay. Why can't you guys talk or, or expect answers from comatose patients? Because you know that these patients are comatose, meaning that they're in a state in which none of the impulses in their body is being processed. Okay. So it does not matter how many times you do whatever you do none of the in, in, none of the informations will get processed and what is the reason behind that is it because they they do not have a functioning brain or is it because their spinal cords are not functioning uh, and the reason is everything is functioning except the reticular activating system 
okay the radical activating system is the only thing that is not functioning for which the patient is comatose okay do you guys understand now did you guys understand now okay so next time you receive a question about a comatose patient and if they ask you which structure is damaged or has decreased blood supply what is your answer what is your answer reticular activating system okay very good okay the reason why i said this it's because this information was taken uh, from u world okay and also a bit from emboss and also a bit from firecracker and this and uh, first aid does not contain this information as of yet okay next one okay so the next one is next group of uh, next group of ascending cracks which which i want to talk about okay so we are done with the dorsal column medial lemniscus system do we have any questions from the dorsal column before we move forward please if the thalamus is destroyed the patient will have loss of sensory sensations but the motor sensations will stay intact okay so the, so the patient will not be comatose okay any more questions from the dorsal column clinically how do you decide a patient is in a comatose state okay so this is a good question but uh what we will be doing is i would be answering this question after the end of the lecture because this is this would take us away from the text okay so gcs scale is one way meaning the glasgow coma scale and we would start uh discussing the glasgow coma scale and everything when we come to the necessary pathology but for now um I want to focus on finishing the the tracts. Okay, so very good question by Dr. M S, and we will be discussing the answer after the end of the lecture. Okay, but for now, do you guys have any questions about dorsal column? Because I would really like to move forward to the spinothalamic tracts. Okay, so hoping no one has any questions from the dorsal column. Once again, one last question before we move forward: Where does the decussations of the of the dorsal column tracts occur? In which structure? Where do the decussate? This is a high yield question. Medullary decussation. Medullary decussation. Very good. Okay, next one. Next, next, next question. Uh, I mean, um, the next uh, discussion is uh, about uh, the spinothalamic tracts. Okay, and we also already talked about the lateral spinothalamic tracts, which detects pain and temperature from uh, any side of the body. And for the purpose of this diagram, okay, this is an example of the pain and temperature detected from the right side of your body. Okay, so what is going on over here? So first of all, you have receptors. Okay, and what are the names of the sensory receptors that are responsible for pain and temperature sensations? Can I get some fast answers, please? Can I get some fast answers? Name of the sensory receptor that is responsible for detecting pain and temperature sensations. And the answer is, okay, free nerve ending. Very good. So you have your sensory receptors, which are free nerve endings. And we talked about them. If no one, if anyone has a pro, has a difficulty remembering that lecture, we talked about Pacinian corpuscle, Pac-Man and Messi and uh, make PPT. Okay, so I'm talking about that lecture. Over there, we talked about the fact that how free nerve endings, they detect pain and they detect temperature and then they generate an impulse and that impulse goes all the way from the periphery. And uh, first of all, what happens is you have the A delta and the C fibers. And once again, A delta is fast, C is low, so slow. So depending on that. So uh, these are uh, impulses, they enter the spinal cord through once again, the dorsal root ganglion, okay? The dorsal root ganglion. And uh, what happens is over here, you have the pseudo unipolar cells once again, and through that pseudo unipolar cells and the dorsal root ganglion, they enter the spinal cord, meaning the posterior horn of the spinal cord, not the anterior horn. They enter the posterior horn of the spinal cord. And then what happens is the difference between dorsal column and spinal thalamic tracts are the, spinal, uh, the, the dorsal column have a medullary decussation. The tracts of the spinal cord, they have a spinal decussation. Okay, so they have a spinal decussation. And uh, what happens is after they decussate over here, as you can see that they already synapsed. Okay, so this is the first synapse and then in the in the second order so there are there are first order neurons and then there are second order neurons first order neurons are the neurons which are coming over here the second order neurons are the ones which have started after the synapse so in the second order neuron they have a spinal decussation and they synapse all the way to our favorite lateral spinothalamic tracts okay and after they enter the lateral spinothalamic tracts they extend all the way upward Okay, there is no necessary nucleus or uh, which are very specific for, for example, we had gracilis and cuneatus for this one, but this one has no more nucleus and they enter all the way up. Then they enter the reticular activating system once again. And from there, they enter the ventral posterolateral nucleus of the thalamus. And from the ventral posterolateral nucleus of the thalamus, you have the 
third order neurons. Okay, so this is another synapse, and then they go to the brain to the somatosensory cortex for you to detect the pain and for you to detect the temperature. Is that clear to everyone? Is that clear to everyone? Everyone, is that clear to you guys? Okay, good. Did you guys understand the two ascending tracts? Did you guys understand the two ascending tracts? Okay. Do you guys want to? Uh, do you guys want to do? Do you guys want to take a quick picture of the thing, or do you guys want me to post this on the group? Okay, so post. Okay, uh, I will fill the group. And while uh, while I discuss this, you guys can take uh, you guys can take the picture. Okay. So once again, before moving forward forward to the descending tracks, we are, we have already talked about the ascending tracks, and the ascending tracks are two <clears throat> two very important one that is dorsal column and spinal thalamic tract. In dorsal column, you have uh, the you have sensory receptors which detect fine touch proprioception. And then they enter the dorsal root ganglion, okay? And then what they do is they enter uh, the uh, dorsal column of the spinal cord and they enter upward through the gracilis and the cuneatus. And then they synapse in the nucleus of the medulla. This is the first order neuron. And the second order neuron <clears throat> begins from the nucleus, the gracilis and cuneatus. And they decussate in the opposite direction and then they extend upward to the midbrain. And then they go to the thalamus and the ventral posterior lateral nucleus where they synapse again. And then the third order neuron goes from the thalamus to the brain. That's it. The second one is the spinal thalamic tract, which starts from the sensory receptors, which are the free nerve endings. From there, they enter the dorsal root ganglion. <clears throat> After that, they have uh, synapses in the posterior horn. From there, they do uh, decussations in the spinal cord and then they extend upwards. Okay, and after they extend upwards, um, they extend upwards to the lateral spinal thalamic tract. This is the second order neuron that goes all the way. There is no other decussation except the spinal one. <clears throat> and then they reach the ventral postural lateral nucleus of the thalamus. And from there, the third order neurons, they go to the cerebral cortex. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Okay, the ventral, the ventral postlateral nucleus of the thalamus is important for detecting sensations of the body except the face. Okay, very basically put, that's what it is. Okay, so that it is. Let's go to, uh, so I'm pretty sure we have covered almost everything. Okay, so read it, read it once again. Okay, read this once again and then see if we have missed out on anything. I highly doubt we have. Okay, now the next one is, uh, one second please. Okay. Okay. So the next uh, group of discussions that we are going to do is about the lat is about the cortical spinal tracts. Okay. So so till now we talked about the ascending fibers, meaning that the information coming from the periphery to the brain. Now we will talk about the information which comes from the brain and which goes to the spinal cord and then to the muscle. So if you want to move your body or make a certain decisions make a certain decision then this is then this is the information which you are uh, processing to your muscles okay okay so what's happening over here is let, let's start from the beginning so first of all you have the pre-mortal first of all okay so let's let's come from the very very basic okay so what happens is first of all you think about doing something okay so the first impulse the first absolute impulse about an action is a thought okay the first absolute impulse about an action is a thought so first of all, you have a thought, okay? And we know the part of the brain which helps in generations of thoughts and ideas. And what is that part of the brain, please? Is that part of the brain? Very good. Uh, premotor, no, it's not premotor, okay? It's not premotor, okay. Anyone else? Which, which is the part of the brain that is involved for thoughts, for generating ideas? Frontal lobe, that, that is his prefrontal cortex. Okay, so we have the part of the cortex, which is known as the frontal uh, cortex or the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is that part of the brain that is, in, that is important for generation of thoughts and ideas. Okay, so first of all, you have a thought, you have a thought, and that is the first step of an action because what happens is when you have a thought, okay, after you have a thought, you have an idea, and then you plan, okay, so thoughts, ideas, planning, and after you plan on how you can execute that task, then you generate an action, okay? Okay, so first of all, you have a thought, okay? And that thought occurs in the prefrontal cortex. And that, that thought, okay, 
travels all the way. Okay, that thought becomes an idea, and then idea becomes a planning. That all happens in the prefrontal cortex. Okay, as mentioned by Dr. Naul over here, prefrontal cortex, and from the prefrontal cortex, this thought, if you decide to perform the action associated with this thought. This thought goes all the way from the prefrontal cortex to, e to your premotor cortex. Premotor cortex by a group of white matters, okay, by a group of white matters which are known as corona radiata, okay, which, is, which are known as corona radiata. So the corona radiators are basically white matters in the brain that helps transmit information from one segment of the brain to another segment of the brain, okay? So uh, is everyone uh, understanding my, um, is everyone understanding my uh, discussion? If not, do you guys want me to draw a diagram for this? Okay, okay, let me, let me just draw a quick diagram. Okay, let me just draw a quick diagram over here. Okay, so first of all, you have, you have, the, you have the brain, okay? First of all, you have the brain, okay? So first of all, let's take something for example, okay? Let's think about drinking a glass of water. Okay, let's think the action is drinking the glass of water. Okay, so what the thing is, you you do not necessarily start drinking the glass of water uh, without having an idea to drink about the glass of water. Okay, so what happens is first at, at first you start thinking about drinking the glass of water because you have sensations, let's say thirst. Okay, and then this thought, uh, it, it starts generating in your prefrontal cortex. Okay, and that thought becomes an uh, idea. Okay, and after you have that idea, you have a proper planning. And after you have the planning, this prefrontal cortex, it sends impulses for, to your premotor cortex. To your premotor cortex. And then uh, this impulse that goes to the premotor cortex, it goes to the corona radiator. Okay, and this impulse, this, this goes to the premotor cortex by the corona radiator. And then from the premotor cortex, this uh, impulse is further uh, generated and then this send impulses to the primary motor cortex. Okay, and then this, this goes to the primary motor cortex and then the primary motor cortex sends all this information all the way to your hands. Okay, it sends this information all the way through your hands by the pathway which we will discuss right now. And then you decide to move your hands to grab the glass of water and then you drink that glass of water. Is that clear to everyone? Is that clear to everyone? Okay, you were a bit fast today. Okay, I apologize. I, I do not mean to be fast, but um, the reason why I'm a bit fast is because I, I want you guys to understand, and at the same time, I want to finish neurology. Okay, so I'll go a bit slow. Okay, so thank you for your feedback. But did you guys understand your um, uh, your mechanism for turning a thought into an action? Okay, good. Okay. So what's happening over here is let's go back to our diagram. Okay, so the, 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 this is all because I want you guys to know that you 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 don't you do not just perform an action. Okay, nothing happens for the matter of just happening. Okay, so the reason why this is happening is because you have already thought about doing it, and you have already thought about executing the plan. Okay, so that's exactly what's happening. So now you have, uh, first of all, according to the homunculus, okay, if you guys remember the homunculus, we talked about the fact that you have the legs and the medial, the trunks and the arms. So if you want to move something accordingly, you have to send impulses from these specific segments of your cortex. Okay, so what's happening is, first of all, the impulse is generated uh, and the impulse goes down. Okay, so first of all, you have the cell bodies in the primary motor cortex. And then what happens is the impulse, it descends ipsilaterally or it, de it descends through the same side, okay? It descends all the way to the same side until it reaches the posterior limb of the internal capsule, okay? After it reaches the posterior limb of the internal capsule, and uh, what happens is the posterior limb of the internal capsule, uh, they did not specify that, okay? So this is where the internal capsule is, okay? So this is the internal capsule, okay? So if you guys can see this, Okay, wait, let me, shh, let me make it clear to you guys. Okay, the internal capsule is basically this thing over here. Okay, that's one, and then you have another one. Okay, okay, and this is what is the, this is the internal capsule in here. Okay, so if you draw something like this all the way over here, and if you draw something like this all the way through over here, okay, this is your internal capsule, this area of X. This X area is the internal capsule, and this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule, and this is the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And the information from the brain enters the posterior limb of the internal capsule, and then it uh, enters down, okay? Then it keeps on going down, and then it uh, enters the midbrain, 
Okay, so it's entering the brainstem as of right now. Where does it enter the midbrain? This is not important to know. Okay, <clears throat> and um, what happens is after they enter the brainstem, they enter the midbrain, palms, and when they go to the medulla, okay, when they go to the medulla, they have a deca session at the lower portions of the medulla, and this is known as a this is known as another medullary deca session or this part of the medullary decussion is known as pyramidal decussion, okay? Because we do not want to confuse medullary decussions of the dorsal column with the medullary decussions of the corticospinal tract. So for the dorsal column, uh, we call it medullary decussions. And for the pyramidal tracts, we call it the pyramidal decussions. But the basic knowledge is the decussions are happening at the medulla, okay? That's the basic knowledge. Okay, so once again, they decussate at the medulla. And once they decussate at the medulla, now the information coming from this side has transferred to this side. So it's in, so it's coming to this side right now. So it goes down, okay, and goes down, and then it enters the lateral corticospinal tract, and then it enters the lateral corticospinal tract, okay, the tract that we talked about. And from the tract, what happens is they enter into the cell body of the anterior horn, okay. What happens is they enter the cell body of the uh, they enter the cell body of the anterior horn, okay? So th this is the cell body that they enter to and they enter all the way up to here. And from here, what they do is they go and they leave the spinal cord. And they, they what they do is they go and they leave the spinal cord. Through. So it enters all the way through here and then they leave through here, okay? And once they leave, the next portion that they go to is the neuromuscular junction. They go to the neuromuscular junction and in the neuromuscular junction, we know exactly what's happening. We talked about them that when you have an impulse coming to the neuromuscular junction, you have release of neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, okay? And then you have release of acetylcholine, which, uh, which uh, generates an end action potential, okay? Or end plate potential in the muscle. And from there, the muscle has action potentials, okay? We talked about them, how the action potentials in the muscle uh, starts, and then uh, the action potential gets transferred by transverse tubules, and there's release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then there's trop tropomyosin, troposy, uh, tr troponin, okay? And all of those things. So all the way from a thought, you have this information. So for, once again, all it needs is one thought. So after that thought is completed, from the thought, you have all this thing happening, okay? So, so once again, from the time you think about doing something to the time that that thing is already done, okay? So something as simple as grabbing your phone or something as simple as grabbing your mouse or something as simple as right now uh, grabbing your pen, okay? This is the exact thing that is happening in your brain all the way to your muscles and I find that absolutely fascinating, okay? And that is exactly what's happening. So is everyone clear? Is everyone clear? about um, the corticospinal tract. Okay. Okay, so did you guys understand exactly what's happening from all the way from a thought all the way to the muscular, uh, to the microscopic level of the muscle? Yes, no? Okay, good. Okay, so can we move forward? Can we move forward then? Okay, so can I get some uh, can I get some answers before I move forward? Okay, so first of all, answer. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the corticospinal tracts, and I, I have uh, I would understand that you guys have understood. Okay, so first of all, where does the thought generate? Where do you get an idea? Can I get some fast answers, please? Fast answers prefrontal cortex. And then you send the information from the prefrontal cortex to the premotor by which white matter? By which white, which white matter? Corona radiata. Very good. And from the premotor, it goes to the primary motor. Okay. And from the primary motor, where does it go to? Where, where does the information go to? Where does the information go from the primary motor? From through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, that is very good. From the posterior limb of the, through the posterior limb, not from the posterior limb, through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Where does this information go to? And decussate. Where is the information decussating? Medulla. So this is the middle decussation. 
or medulla decussation. And once they decussate in the medulla, they go to the spinal cord, okay? And when they go to the spinal cord, um, when they go to the spinal cord, where, where do they go to? They go to the anterior horn and then they go to the, where they end, where do they end this impulses? In the neuromuscular junctions. In the neuromuscular junctions, what do they, what do they release? Which neurotransmitter do, do they release? Yes. As alcohol, when they bind as alcoholine receptors, okay, which which ion channel is opened? Okay, after you have a generation of an impulse, after you have a generation of an impulse, okay, which ion is released from the sarcopathic reticulum? Calcium. Okay. And uh, this impulse, okay, this impulse that has been released, what is the structure that is responsible for uh, transmitting this impulse all the way to the muscle for a spontaneous contraction? Transverse tubules. Okay, very good. And uh, this calcium that has been released from the sarcopathic reticulum, what, where did they go and bind to? Which protein? Where do they go and bind to? The calcium that has been released? Okay, so now do you get the idea about what's happening all the way from the brain to your muscles? Okay, so I'm pretty sure this should be, this should be very easy for you to now understand. Okay, so this is a very basic knowledge and very basic concept that you have to master. And I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure every one of you have mastered this knowledge. And how would you know you have mastered a knowledge? Okay, so what is a master? Master is basically. Um, mastering a knowledge meaning when you have the ability to explain that knowledge to someone else okay so how would you know that you have mastered that knowledge is if you can go to your hospital or to your clinic or you have a you have a colleague or friend in need who wants to uh, learn about the tracts if you can make them understand the uh, tracts okay then you have mastered it and then you would know that you have successfully understood the whole thing okay so the best way to learn is to teach someone, okay? So um, if you can teach someone about the tracks, and this is a very solid advice, okay? Try to teach someone about the tracks and try to teach someone about the basal ganglia. And when, when you try to treat them, uh, I, mean, I mean, teach them about uh, the tracks and the basal ganglia, this will allow you to understand it way better, okay? Okay, next one. Next thing which I want to talk to you guys about are, okay, the next thing that I want to talk, talk to you about are, first of all, First of all, let's go back to our table, okay? And then we are done with uh, descending tracks too, okay? So we are done with the descending tracks. So I will upload the picture in the group and you guys can uh, view the text and then go back to the, go back to the picture and, and uh, read accordingly, okay? So that's what I will do, okay? Okay, next one. Next one, which, which I wanna talk to you about are the reflexes, okay? Let's talk a little bit about the central reflexes, okay? One second. Okay, so the basically, what are the reflexes? Reflexes are basically, uh, what are reflexes? One second, please. I don't even know why this keeps on happening. One second, please. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, what's happening is right now we will be talking about the reflexes. The reflexes are basically you have uh, reflexes such as the Achilles reflex. You have reflexes such as the patellar and then you have biceps and triceps and cremasteric reflex, okay? So the reflex are basically, um, the definition of the reflex is uh, basically what happens is when you, have an, when, you, when you have an impulse that is generated, you have spontaneous contraction of your muscles all the way through a circuit that is provided from the input to the periphery around your spinal cord and back to the muscle, okay? So it's a reflex or mostly involuntary movement of the muscle due to the due to the presence of an external stimuli okay so what are the reflexes that you have to understand about uh, about um, the body is you have reflexes of which you have to understand or you have to know the uh, root levels okay so this is a very rough diagram of uh, this is a very rough diagram of a human okay so this is the you know the face body legs and then we're just drawing the arm okay okay so what's happening is the first reflex that I want to talk about is um, the first reflex that I want to talk about are the biceps and triceps. Okay, uh, are the are the biceps biceps? Okay, so okay, so for what we're going to do is we're going to 
learn about uh, rhyme. Okay, so we have nursery rhymes. Okay, so if you guys have little babies at home or little kids at home and they want to learn about new rhymes, I have this exact new rhyme, rhyme for you. Okay, nursery rhyme C5, C6, pick up the sticks. C5, C6, pick up the sticks. So how do you pick up a stick? You pick up a stick when you when you contract your bicep. Okay, so when you contract your bicep, you pick up your you pick up a stick. So what is the rhyme? The rhyme is C five C six. Pick up the sticks. Okay. Next line of the next line of the rhyme is you have the next reflexes. Okay. And the next reflexes, which which are the C six, C seven. C eight, lay them, lay them straight. Okay, so C five, C six, pick up the sticks. C six, C seven, C eight, lay them straight. How do you lay your arms straight when you contract your tricep? When you contract your tricep, your arms get, your arms get flat. So if your arms were, let's say, this is your arms and this this is your tricep, right? When you contract it, the arms will will be straight. Okay, so C5, C6, pick up the sticks, C6, C7, C8, lay them straight. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, okay. Next, next one. The next group of rhymes are four. Um, next, next one is, uh, what, what was the, okay, all right. Okay, good. So the next one was L2, that's what I remember. Okay, L2, L4. Okay, L2, L4, L2, L4, kick the door. C5, C6, pick up the sticks. C6, C7, C8, lay them straight. Okay, so biceps, triceps. L2, L4, kick the door. Okay, so how do you kick a door? When you, con when you contract your quadriceps over here, over the, um, when you contract your, when you contract your, uh, your quadriceps over here, over the patella. Okay, then you have straightening of the legs. And when you straighten your legs, you can kick a door. So this is the patella reflex. So L2, L4, kick the door. Okay, next one. Next one is S1, S2, S1, S2, buckle my shoe. Okay, let me see if I have written down everything. C5, C6, kick up the sticks. C7, C8, C7, C8, lay them straight lay them straight next one next one is next one is um l2 l2 l4 kick the door okay then s1 s1 s2 s1 s2 buckle my shoes okay even i forget at times okay s1 s2 buckle my shoes okay okay buckle my shoes okay next one next one is next one is okay next one is l1 l2 l1 and l2 l1 l2 testicles move okay l1 l2 testicles move so this is for your cremasteric reflex l l1 l2 testicles move okay so maybe you should skip out on this part of the rhyme when you teach when you teach your child Okay, so this part of the rhyme is not for teaching your child. Okay, so L1, L2, testicles move. Do not teach this to your child. This is absolutely unimportant. Okay, so if you want to teach your child of this rhyme, okay, so C5, C6, cut the sticks. C6, C7, C8, lay them straight. L2, L4, kick the door. S1, S2, buckle my shoes. That's it. That's up to here for your child's learning. Now the next one is for your learning. That is L1, L2, testicles move. And the next one is you have S3, S4, S3, S4, S3, S4, winks galore. You have ankle winks. I mean, uh, you have uh, anal winks, anal winks. Anal winks is basically tightening up your uh, anal spinster. Okay, so S3, S4 is winks galore, winks galore. Okay, so once again, once again, how does the rhyme go? C5, C6, pick up the sticks, meaning biceps, uh, roots, okay, C5, C6, for picking up the sticks, you need biceps, C6, C7, C8, lay them straight, meaning that um, you have to lay your arms straight with the help of your triceps, so these are the three one, 
L2, L4 kick the door. So if for kicking the door, you have to contract your quadriceps over the patella. S2, S1, S2, buckle my shoes. Okay, so in order for you to buckle your shoes, you have to reach all the way to your ankle. And these, the, this is the uh, this is the Achilles reflex. Okay, that's where the Achilles tendon is, Achilles reflex. L1, L2, testicles move. Okay, so this is the cremasteric reflex. And S3, S4 are ankle, are, you know, wings galore. Okay, wings galore, that's it. Okay, did you guys understand about uh, this small rhyme, which you can try at home, except these last two parts, L2, S3, S4, okay? So if you, if you uh, learn this rhyme, you will never forget the bicep reflexes. You will never, you will never forget the roots of the reflexes and that is extremely important. Okay, all right. Okay, let's go back. We have not read the text for a long period of time. Okay, okay. So uh, the next one are primitive reflexes. So these are your clinical reflexes, okay? These are your clinical reflexes and these are primitive reflexes. What do you mean by primitive reflexes? Primitive reflexes meaning that the reflexes that were present in humans and they have been present for a long primitive period of time. Primitive meaning, uh, uh, meaning that uh, the, the um, meaning the portion of the time that was before proper, uh, that was before proper evolution of humans, okay, so primitive. So uh, what happens is uh, if you have uh, babies, you usually have primitive reflexes, okay, so you have a small, you have a little baby who has all these reflexes, and then what happens is eventually when you get older, okay, you forget or you tend to suppress this reflexes, and then you do not have these reflexes anymore. For example, let's say a palmar reflex. A palmar reflex is basically when a, when you <clears throat> when you touch the palm of the baby, the baby tries to hold your finger. Okay, I'm pretty sure you guys have seen that. It's absolutely cute. So that's a palmar reflex. And what happens is uh, once you get older, you don't do that with uh, with adults anymore. So let's say an adult tries to stroke your palm, you get angry. You don't try to. Uh, grab their fingers, okay? So that's a palmar reflex, and the palmar reflex is absent in adults. But for some reason, let's say that your knowledge of palmar reflex, let's say that you learn about the palmar reflex in uh, your adulthood and the fact that it is not in, it is not appropriate, but for some reason, let's say, for example, due to a stroke, due to a stroke or ischemia of the brain, that knowledge of inappropriateness about, about the palmar reflex, it goes away, and what happens is now the, the patients in their adulthood have started having palma reflexes once again. Okay. And, uh, and what, what happens is uh, if you have that reflex in the uh, adult patients, um, <clears throat> that means that uh, this is a sign of stroke. Okay. So this is a sign of stroke or ischemia. Okay. So this is a sign of stroke or ischemia. So is that clear? Did you guys understand? Did you guys understand? That's the whole point of learning the primitive reflexes, okay? The whole point of learning the primitive reflexes is just so that you can watch out for them in adult. If they are present in adult patients, then this means that the patient has uh, ischemia, uh, ischemia or stroke, okay? Which part of, which brain part stroke, okay? It's not specific as to which part of the brain is uh, where the stroke is occurring, okay? For example, um, for example, have you guys heard about the have you guys heard about the Babinski sign? Babinski sign. Okay. Okay, good. So what is the Babinski sign? Babinski sign. What is the Babinski sign? Extension of toe. Okay. What's happening is you have a Babinski sign, meaning that there's extension of the toe and flailing or spreading of all the other uh, of all the other uh, fingers of the leg, right? I mean, like all, like all the other toes, okay? So uh, what happens is when you have a little baby, okay? When you have a little baby, when the little baby steps on the floor, let's say this is the floor and this is a very little baby. And when the little baby, he steps on the floor, okay? So this is a little baby. When he steps on the floor, what happens is the floor scares the little baby's feet Okay, the, I mean, it scares the little baby and the little baby does not want to stand on the floor. So what happens is the little baby wants to extend their feet away from the floor. And this is known as the Babinski sign. And eventually what happens is this uh, area beneath the sole, okay? So this area beneath the sole, when this touches the floor, 
in young babies, uh, they try to extend their uh, toes, okay? Because they do not want to stand on the floor. And this sign is once again is known as the Debenisi sign. But what happens is when you grow older, okay, when you are in your adulthood, when you grow older, what happens is you forget this, okay? You forget the Debenisi sign, why? Because now you are accustomed to the floor and now you're accustomed to surfaces. Uh, now you're accustomed to things touching your surfaces and that is a maturation, a sign of maturation, right? So the Babinski sign, they disappeared, okay? Now what happens is if you have a stroke patient, if you have a patient who comes with a stroke, this knowledge about uh, Babinski or this knowledge about uh, the surface of the floor, if this goes away, what happens is if you have, if you stroke the sole of those patients, let's say we, how we stroke the sole of Babinski is we take the pointed end of a hammer and then we do a stroke like this. So what happens is when you do this kind of stroke, instead of, instead of uh, curling the toes, the patients with stroke, they start, they start having Babinski sign, meaning that they start flailing or they start extending the toes, which is the same sign that they had when they were little babies. Okay, and this is extremely concerning because this is this means that the patient has signs of ischemia of the uh, brain. Okay, Be, uh, uh, and this is known as the Babinski sign. But this is the reason why the Babinski sign is occurring. Do you guys did you guys understand my explanation for the Babinski sign? Why is it happening? Okay, okay. So, so knowing the Babinski sign is not enough, you have to understand why the Babinski sign is happening, and that is exactly what what's happening. And what happens is eventually babies, okay, eventually babies learn. What, let's say you have a little baby, okay, and when you make that little baby stand on the floor, the, ba the, the little baby will not stand on the floor. The little baby will extend their toes and show up a physiological Babinski sign. So that is normal in babies, okay. And eventually, on repeated exposure or with maturation, what will what will happen is the baby will realize that eventually they have to step on the floor. So what they would do is they would curl up their toes and they would curl up their uh, feet. I mean, their toes to have a better grip, okay to have a better grip of the floor, right? So that they don't fall. And this is normal. So in a normal patient, if you stroke like this, they will curl, this toe will come down, this, these, these ones will come down and that is normal, okay? But in patients who are showing Babinski sign, if this, if this maturation sign goes away, the toe starts flailing upwards. And this, is, this shows that the patient has Babinski positive, meaning that the patient is showing signs of a primitive reflex. Okay, did you guys understand why the Babinski sign is happening? Okay, perfect. Okay, did you guys know about this before? Anyone who knew about this, why the Babinski sign is happening, what the Babinski sign is happening? Okay. Why is this happening? Okay, good. Okay, next one. So we have some other reflexes, for example, we have reflexes such as um, Okay, let's read the text. Let's see what they said. They said that, the, that these reflexes disappear within the first year of life. Okay. And what happens is um, if you have these reflexes, which are inhibited by the maturing developed frontal lobe, but if they re-emerge in adults, they mean that the patients have a frontal lobe lesions or loss of inhibitions. Okay. So basically, if, if you have these, these primitive reflexes in patients who are in, in their adulthood, and this means that the reflexes have returned, okay? Next one. Next, the first one is moral reflex. What is the moral reflex? Moral reflex is basically hang on for life, okay? So what happens is when you try to, um, uh, when you try to uh, startle a baby, okay? The moral reflex is basically when you startle a baby, they, they extend their arms all the way up. So if this is a little baby's head, okay? And this is the little baby's arms and legs, Okay, so if you try to startle a baby, startle means if you try to scare a baby, the, the baby will raise up their hands and will extend their feet. And this is known as a moral reflex. And this is a primitive reflex. Next one is rooting reflex. Rooting reflex is, rooting reflex is if you stroke one side of the cheek okay, of the little baby, if you stroke one side of the cheek of the little baby, the little baby will move their uh, face in order to seek for, uh, in, in, in order to seek for, uh, food, okay, in order to seek for food, uh, seek meaning to look for food. And then, in case of little babies, they look for uh, breast milk, okay, so they would try to look at their mother and they would try to see if their food is ready, okay. So, they, if they if you stroke one side of the cheek, the baby will move their face, okay. Next one, 
Next one is sucking reflex. Sucking reflex is basically sucking response. So when you touch the roof of the mouth of the baby, they try to, uh, they, they, they uh, reflexively, they start sucking on it. Okay, so if you try to stroke the mouth of the baby while let's say uh, we have uh, feeders, okay, so we have uh, like little feeders. And then what will happen is once you realize that you feed the baby with a little plastic feeders, they start uh, sucking on the feeder immediately. And this is known as a sucking reflex, okay. The next one is a palmar reflex. Palmar reflex is basically if you curl, curling of the fingers, if the palm is stroked. So if you, if you stroke the palm of the baby, they will curl their fingers in order to uh, grab your uh, finger. So this is a palm reflex. Plantar reflex is basically uh, the one that we just talked about. That is the dorsiflexion of the large toe and fanning of the other toes. If this is present in adulthood, this is a sign of an upper motor neuron lesion. This is exactly what we just discussed for five minutes. Next one is gallanting reflex. Okay, gallanting reflex is if you stroke one side of the spine, if the, if the, if the, if the baby is facing down, the baby will move to the opposite side. I mean, there will be a lateral flexion. Okay. So once again, how important is learning about these reflexes? Okay, the learning about this reflex are basically important is you will receive questions where they will describe the reflex. Okay, they will describe the reflex in your question and they will ask you directly what is the name of the reflex. Okay, so if you have to learn this, what, what do you do is you cover this part with your hand and then you read this part and then you see whether you know the name of the reflexes. So you want to learn about the reflex. Let's say you are trying to test yourself learn read hands-on for reflex and try to ask yourself okay what was the name of this reflex and then go and look at the name of the reflex is more reflex so, it should, so the learning should be from should be from this side to this side okay from this side to this side that's what it is okay is everyone clear about the reflexes is everyone clear about the reflexes Moro reflex. Okay, moro reflex is basically the baby extend their arms and feet when you startle a baby. Startle means scare a baby. Okay. Anything else? Do we have any question? Okay. Okay, next one. Okay, next one are, oh, good. Okay, we are done with the physiology and that's amazing. Okay, we're going to start the pathology. Okay, and that, this makes me extremely happy. Oh, okay, good. And uh, so the next thing which we are going to learn about the dermatomes, okay? So we are going to learn about the dermatomes and this will not take us a long time, okay? This will not take us a long time. So uh, learning about the dermatomes is, first of all, this is, this is extremely easy, okay? This looks highly, highly complicated, but you have no idea how easy this is. And I will break it down for you how how you can address a, a dermatomal distribution. The dermatomal distribution is basically the roots of the spinal cord, which are responsible for providing cutaneous sensations to the skin at different regions. So you have all these regions in your body, which are uh, innervated by the spinal roots, okay? So first of all, let's start talking about the face, okay? In the face, and we all know that the face is heavily supplied by trigeminal nerve. And then we have the ophthalmic division, then we have the maxillary division, Okay, and then we have the mandibular division. So the face is done. Okay, so we have V1, V2, V3, and the face is done. Okay, next one. Next one is C2. Okay, so next one, the, the next group of distribution is C2. So, so this is C2 over here. And C2 is the posterior part of the skull. Okay, so C2 is the posterior part, part of the skull. So if you look at the human being from the behind, the part of the skull over here, if you touch this area, if you touch this area, then the um, pathway through which the uh, nerves would travel is through C2. Okay, next next one. Next one is C3. Okay, and the reason and the way you can understand C3 is the way you can understand C3 is C3 is up to the collar. Okay, okay. C3 is let's say you have a high turtleneck shirt. Okay, so let's say you have your patient over here, and that patient is wearing a turtleneck. Okay, turtleneck meaning. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys know what a turtleneck is, if everyone knows, okay, for everyone, okay. Okay, so this is, this is basically a turtleneck, okay, so this is a, so this is a turtleneck, okay, so in, in not this one, okay, this one, so in a patient, um, if, let's say for, for this guy over here, okay, so for this guy, this area, up to the turtleneck, this area, this area is where C3 starts, so this is the beginning of C3, okay. This is the beginning of C3. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, next one is C4. 
C4 are low collar shirts. For example, the shirt which you are wearing right now, if, if it has a normal collar, the area uh, where the collar usually starts is the C4. Okay, so, so what did we discuss till now? V1, V2, V3, we talked about C2, that's the back of the skull. C3 is the, this high turtleneck guy. C4 is you wearing a normal collared shirt, okay? Okay, next one. Next one is, um, before we move on to the hand portion, okay, this is where it gets a little bit confusing, but before we move on to the hand portion, let's finish the rest of the body. Next one I wanna talk about is T4. T4 are at the level of your nipples, okay? So this is the level of your nipples and this is where T4 is, okay? So, and then all the way up from T4 to the low collar is T1, T2, T3, and then that is your distribution. And then from your T4 all the way to your end of the xephoid process, so you have the manubrium sterni, and then from the manubrium sterni, you have the xephoid process, okay? The xephoid process is the part of the manubrium sterni where the manubrium, where the manubrium sterni ends. I'm pretty sure you guys know what the manubrium sterni is, okay? Okay, so the T7 is the, as at the level of the xephoid process of the manubrium sterni, okay? Next one. Next one is T10. T10 is at the level of the umbilicus. And we all know this because this is, this is very famous for uh, appendicitis, appendicitic pain. Okay, so T10. So this is T10 because we get referred pain over here from the, from the appendix. Okay, so all the way from the z process, which is at T7 to T10, we have T8, 9. Okay, next one. Next one is L1. L1 is right below the inguinal ligament. Okay, L1 or IL meaning that it's right below the inguinal ligament, okay? And then we have L4. L4 is basically, L4 is basically this, this portion over here, meaning that uh, all the uh, kneecaps, okay? And if you guys remember, when, when, when we were talking about uh, neurovascular radiculopathy, okay, we talked about the fact how the nerves travel. And if you have a patient with lumbar or sciatica, uh, which part of the nerves are innervated, we talked about this in the musculoskeletal portion in the anatomy, okay? So once again, L4 is uh, this part of the leg, which contains all the kneecaps, okay? And then you have your S234. S234 is around your groin area, okay? So S234 is groin and anal area. So this is this is S234, okay? So once again, let's, we're talking about the midline and, and we didn't talk about the arms. We will talk about the arms right now before we do that. We have V1, V2, V3 for the face. Next one is if anyone asks you, where is C2? C2 is the back of your skull. Next one is if anyone asks you what where is C3? C3 is your high turtleneck guy over here. This is if you wear a turtleneck sweater, then this is your C3. Next one is C4 is if you wear a low collar shirt for the shirt which you are wearing right now. The amount of uh, collarbone which is which can be seen is your level of C4. Then where is uh, let's say T T4 T4 is at the level of the nipples. T7 is at the level of the xiphoid process. L1 is below the inguinal ligament. Okay. L1, inguinal ligament, and then every area in between them is easy. And then you have L4, which is uh, your, uh, your kneecap. Okay, so it goes all the way through your kneecaps over here. And then you have S234, which is the groin area over here. Now let's talk about your um, arms. Okay, so in your arms, you see that uh, you, in your arms you have, okay, in your arms you see that you have C678. Okay, so C6, C7, C8. So if you look at the back of the arms, it's really easy because it's all the way from the lateral to the medial. So from the lateral to medial, you have C6 all the way, C7, and then C8. And uh, eventually, even on the Palmer side, you have the same thing. You have C6, C8, and then C5, okay? So this is not that high yield, okay? Because um, the thing is, they ask you more about the median nerve and the ulnar nerve distribution of the hands. So that's more high yield. That three, the first three and a half digits are median and the rest are ulnar. So that is more important. So let the focus on that one and focus on this one for your uh, medial um, dermatomal distribution. Okay. Okay. So have you guys learned about the dermatomes perfectly? Have you guys learned about the dermatomes? Have you guys understood the dermatomes? Okay. So what we are going to do is after, so we're going to do is what we're going to do is we are going to take a break. Okay. And before we take that break, I want you guys to have the satisfaction of knowing that you guys have finished your neurology, anatomy, and physiology. Okay, and we have successfully moved on to neurobas uh, neurology pathology. And uh, neurology anatomy and neurology physiology 
is an extremely high yield topic and it's a very difficult and um, lengthy topic. And uh, it's amazing that you that we have finished it in um, this period of time. So congratulations and thank you so much for being with us throughout the whole lecture. Okay, even for all the students who are watching this uh, video from home. Uh, okay, so thank you to you guys too. As of right now, you guys have finished neurology, patho uh, new, 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 uh, neurology anatomy and neurology physiology. Okay, having said that, let's take our break right now. Okay, uh, let's take our break for 10 minutes. How long, 10 minutes or five minutes? Five, five minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Fifteen minutes or half an hour. Half an hour or one hour break. Okay, <laughs> all right. So we will be taking, um, okay, so Okay, so uh, we would not be taking a one hour break, nor will we be taking a half an hour break. Okay, what we would be taking is we would be taking a 10 minute break. Okay, and that's what we do every day. And that's what we will do today. Okay, so we will take around 10 to 15 minutes around that time. And after we come back, we will see whether we have successfully solidified the information about the dermatomes. And only after doing that, shall, shall we move forward to neurology pathology. Okay.
Oh, okay, is everyone back from their break? Okay, we have taken quite a long break. Um, okay, we're back in exactly 15 minutes. So, so far, have you guys understood neuro, uh, neuro, neuro, uh, your neurology, anatomy, and physiology? Okay, can we do a small uh, recap of the dermatomes before we move forward? Okay, uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves and um, answer the question because it will, it will save me some time, okay? Okay, so what I would like you to know is, uh, I would like to know is if you guys have understood the levels. <clears throat> so feel free once again to unmute yourselves and tell me the answer so that I know exactly uh, what you're talking about, okay? Okay, so face. What is the what is the dermatome of here? V1. Okay, here? V2. Here? V3. Okay, so we had one doctor saying all the dermatomes. How about the other doctors? Okay, please feel free to um, participate. Okay, next one. Is it, this, this is the back of the skull. What is the dermatomal level? C2. Oh, C2. Very good. Okay, what is the dermatomal level of here? C3. C3. Very good, very good, guys. Then immediately below C3, if you wear a low collar shirt like this, what is the dermatomal level? C4. 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 Okay, let me draw the rest of the body. Okay, then we're gonna go down. Okay, all right. Okay, and if this is the, the this is the uh, E4. E4. Four. Four. E4. Okay. E4. E4. Very good, very good. Okay, very good. Okay, so C4, and then we have C6, T1, T2, T3, and then T4. And if this is the uh, Z4 process, Okay. T6, T7, 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 T7,
um, this 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 page over here if needed. If needed, take a picture of this page, put it in your uh, phone, put it in your laptop, or better yet, what you can do is print out this page and take a print and post it on your wall in your room so that whenever you get a chance to look at it, look at this, okay? You will get abundant amount of questions, abundant amount of questions from this, from this table. This is basically a very general basic idea about which parts of the brain are uh, damaged and uh, what, would, what would the consequences be, okay? So first of all, let's talk about um, first of all, let's talk about our frontal lobe. Okay, so basically, the frontal lobe. We know that the frontal lobe is Im important for making uh, decision, judgments, uh, thoughts, ideas. Okay, <clears throat> and um, the frontal lobe is the is the part of the brain where you decide that you should not be performing the primitive tasks which you you use to perform. So let's say little babies cry a lot. Okay, so we know that little babies they have a tendency of crying a lot whenever they get upset, but as as we uh, become an as we become an adult, we realize that crying is always not an option because this is a, a sign of immaturity and uh, crying during difficult situation is not the right action. So our frontal lobe decides that um, it's 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 about time that crying should stop. Okay, so crying is just an example. For for let's so uh, let's say for example uh, you have uh, you have uh, the frontal lobe lesion. Okay, if you, let's say if you have a frontal lobe lesion. Okay, what could happen is all those primitive things which you used to do, okay, all those primitive reflexes which you used to do, you used to do moral reflex, planter, then you used to do uh, palmer, right? Then you, you used to do uh, sucking reflex and uh, grasping reflex, and those things will start coming back. So if you have a frontal lobe lesion, what will happen is, first of all, you cannot decide on, on anything, so you, you will have disinhibition and deficits in concentration, meaning that you cannot put your concentration in one thing. You will keep on jumping from one topic to another, okay? then you will have your re-emergence of primitive reflexes, okay? So this is very easy to understand. Do we have any questions regarding this frontal lobe gene? Do we have any question? Oh, okay, so no questions about this, about the understanding of what is, um, there is no question. Okay, there is no question. Okay, so what is anxiety related to? Okay, I will come to that. No problem. I will tell you why you get anxious. Okay, please bear with me. But for this one, how would you receive your question? They receive you will receive your question. For example, they will say that you will have a patient who comes to you who has problems with concentrations. The patient has personality changes. The patient has um, has re, re emergence of some primitive behaviors. Okay, and the lesion which uh, you should be looking out for is the frontal lobe lesion. Okay, okay, next one. Next one is a frontal eye field lesion. Frontal eye field lesion, meaning that you, this, the, you, you remember we talked about the brain like this. Okay, we talked about uh, the brain and we talked about this uh, area over here. This is known as the frontal eye field. Okay, so if you have a patient who with a frontal eye field lesion, okay, what will happen is the eyes will look towards the sign of, of the lesion. So the frontal eye field is responsible for proper coordination of uh, the visual pathways, right? And if you do not have proper coordination of the visual pathways, what will happen is the eyes will deviate to the side in which the lesion is occurring. So let's say you have a right-sided brain lesion, the frontal eye field, will, the eyes will look towards the side of the brain lesion. And how will you receive questions? You will say, uh, the question will say that you have a patient who has come to you with eyes deviated and with signs of stroke and, um, the deviation of the eye is toward the right side. And if they specify the deviation, then, then try to understand that they're talking about a frontal eye field lesion, meaning that there has been a destruction of the, uh, de meaning that there has been a destructive lesion of the frontal eye field, okay? Okay, so I will ask you, I will ask whether you guys have, have questions after I have discussed the topic, okay? So bear with me. If you guys have any questions, please keep them in mind and ask me the questions after, okay? Okay, next one. Next one is paramedian pontine reticular formation. Can can you guys give me one minute, please? I just just give me one minute, one second, one minute, okay. <clears throat>
Okay, perfect. Okay, let's begin. Okay. Okay. So uh, we were talking about the frontal eye field lesion. Okay, so what will happen is uh, if you have a frontal eye field lesion, once again, the brain or the eyes will deviate towards the side of the lesion, okay? Uh, eyes look towards the side of the brain lesion. So what happens is if you have a right-sided brain lesion, the eyes will look towards the right side. But if you have the right-sided brain lesion, what which part of the body will get uh, paralyzed? If you have a right-sided brain lesion, which part of the body will get paralyzed? Left, okay? So the eyes will let look towards the side of the lesion, but it will look away from the side of the paralysis, okay? Very easy to understand because the brain is responsible for sending impulses to the contralateral side due to pyramidal decompositions. Okay. Next one is, next one is paramedian pontine reticular formation. So paramedian pontine reticular formation is basically a group of uh, um, this is basically a group of uh, new, this is basically a group of neurons <clears throat> that is responsible for proper coordination and movement of uh, the eyes. Right, once again for proper coordination and for movement of the eyes. And for the the difference with parapontine reticular paramedian pontine reticular formation is we would be discussing this in details in the, the visual pathways. But for right now, PPRF is basically your uh, part of the brain that is responsible for proper coordination and movement of the eyes. And if you have a parapontine, uh, paramedian pontine reticular formation damage, the eyes will look away from the brain of the lesion. The eyes will look away, okay? The eyes will look away. And the way that I would like to think is, um, I would like to think is, okay, PPRF, okay? Okay, PPRF, okay? Okay, so PPRF and frontal eye field. Okay, frontal eye field. So, the, what is the difference between frontal eye field and PPRF lesions? One in frontal eye, one in, uh, in in frontal eye field, the eyes look away from the side of the hemiplegia, and in PPRF, the eyes look towards the side of the hemiplegia. Eyes look towards the side of the eyes look towards the side of the hemiplegia. Okay, and um, eyes look towards the side of the hemiplegia, and the way that um, I would like to think is over here, you have two P's, okay? Over here, just bear with me over here, okay? Then I will explain how the mnemonic goes. Uh, over here, you have two P's, and for me, the two P stands for double paralysis, okay? And over here, let's say if there's only two P's over here, there's no P. So let's say over here, there's only single paralysis. So over here, if you have, this is a mnemonic, guys, okay? Once again, this is just a mnemonic for you to understand so that you can answer your questions better. If you guys have, let's say PPRF have two Ps, so two Ps for double paralysis. And if you have one P, if you have one P, one P is for single paralysis. And uh, for single paralysis, you will be less aware and you will not look towards the side of the, you will not look towards that side because you will be less aware. But but if you have double paralysis, meaning that PPRF stands have two Ps, then you will be more, more concerned. So you will look towards the side of the lesion. Okay. So you will look towards the side of the lesion. Okay, so this is just a mnemonic. So next time, if you have questions where they tell you that uh, they ask you to differentiate between a frontal eye field and a PRF le lesion, try to think about the word P's. Double P stands for double paralysis. Double paralysis stands for the fact that you have to look towards the side of the lesion. Okay. okay. So do we have any questions regarding this? Do we have any questions regarding this? Okay. 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 Yeah. So once again, PPRF, okay, PPRF stands for paramedian pontine reticular formation. It stands for paramedian pontine reticular formation. Paramedian pontine meaning that there is double paralysis or, or two, two P stands for double paralysis, okay? So when will you be more concerned if you have one paralysis or two paralysis? This is just a mnemonic. This has nothing to do with paralysis, okay? This is just a mnemonic for you to understand where the eyes will look. In Paramedian pontine reticular formation, you have paralysis of uh, a side where the eyes look towards, okay? You have, your eyes look towards the side of the paralysis. Why, when do you look towards the side of the paralysis? So you look towards the side of the paralysis when you are more concerned. When will you be more concerned? You are more concerned when you have double paralysis, two piece, okay? This does not mean that paramedian pontine reticular patients have double paralysis. This is just a mnemonic. 
Okay, this is just a mnemonic that two P's stands for two paralysis. Okay, so if you would be more concerned about the double paralysis, so you would look towards the side of the lesion. And since over here, you do not have double paralysis, the eyes will look away from the side of the lesion. Is that clear? Is that clear or does this mnemonic confuse me? Does this mnemonic make you guys confused? All I would tell you guys is I have come up with a mnemonic where PPRF stands for two Ps. Two Ps are double paralysis. Let's say, for example, you have a double paralysis. You will look towards that side. Okay, it's and this will help you understand that PPRF lesions are at the lesions where the eyes will look towards the side of the hemiplegia. Okay, so if you have a question where, where the eyes are looking towards the side of the hemiplegia, what is the damage? The damage is in PPRF. And in frontal eye field damage, the eyes will look away from the side of the hemiplegia. Why? Because there is no uh, P over here. P for the mnemonic that we have used, there is no P over here. So that's that. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, you guys got it. Okay, good. Next one. Next one is if you have damage to the median longitudinal fasciculus. If you have damage to the median longitudinal fasciculus, the median longitudinal fasciculus is extremely important for um, transmitting proper for transmitting proper information from ipsilateral eye. Okay, and what happens is it, it, what happens is you, let's say you have an eye over here, you have an eye over here. Okay, and then there are a bunch of stuff going on over here, which we will discuss in details later. But what's, ha what's happening is over here, you have two fasciculus, longitudinal, medium, longitudinal fasciculus. So if, the, uh, if this eye decides to look at this side, okay, if this eye decides to look at this side, there will be immediate action of this eye to look at this side too, okay? So it's impossible for you to have your right eye look to the left without your left eye look to the left too. It's impossible. You can't do that. And that the way the the reason why this is impossible is because whenever this uh, eye decides to look in this way, this eye sends information all the way through the median longitudinal fasciculus, and then the median longitudinal fasciculus allows this eye to also move in in this way. Okay, so that's that. And in the contralateral, vice versa. If this eye decides to move, look that way, this eye will also look that way, and that is occurring through the presence of median longitudinal fasciculus. And now if you have damage to the median longitudinal fasciculus, you will come up with a, with a condition that is known as internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And this means that if this eye moves to this, in this direction, this eye will not move at all. This eye will not move or, um, uh, or, or vice versa. If this eye moves to this way, this eye will not move. As simple as that. And a very famous disease is associated with internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And this famous disease is a demyelinating, the most common pro progressive demyelinating disorder. And this disease is known as multiple sclerosis or MS, okay, multiple sclerosis. And in multiple sclerosis, you have damage to the internuclear ophthalmoplegia. I mean, you have damage to the multiple, uh, to the medial longitudinal fasciculus for which you have internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Is that clear to everyone? The eye problem? Okay. Once again, see if everyone has understood. Okay, if you look towards one side of the lesion, if you look towards the side of the paralysis, what is the damage? If you look towards the side of the damage, uh, to the paralysis, what is the damage? If you look towards the side of the paralysis, towards the side of the paralysis, what is the damage? PPRF, okay? PPR, paramedian pontine reticular formation. If you look away from the side of the damage, what is the lesion? If you look away from the side of the paralysis, frontal eye field. Okay. If you have an eye <clears throat> that moves left, but that another eye does not move accordingly, what is the damage? What is the name of this condition? fasicular damage and the name of the condition is a nuclear ophthalmoplegia and the disease associated with the condition is MS. Okay, so we are done with the eye blooms. Okay, then let's come to the parietal cortex. 
parietal cortex. We all know what the parietal cortex is. We have discussed the parietal cortex yesterday in the regions of the brain. Okay, so parietal cortex. So you have two parietal cortex. You have a dominant cortex and you have a non-dominant cortex, okay? Non-dominant cortex. And what do we mean by dominant and non-dominant parietal cortex? Let's say if you're a right-handed uh, human being, okay? Let's say if you're a right-handed person, then the left side of your brain is more dominant. And then majority of the population, the majority of the population is right-handed. And so in majority of the population, the right side, the left side of the brain is more dominant, okay? And why is the left side of the brain more dominant? Because you use your right hand, since you are right-handed, way more than you use your left hand, okay? Since you use the right hand of your body way more than your left hand, the left, the left part of your brain is obvious, is, is more developed because it, it is undergoing more practice and with practice, it gets better. And, and it gets uh, more um, it gets more decisive and the impulses are stronger okay so that's why the left side of your brain is stronger and more dominant so in majority of the population who are right-handed the left side of the brain is dominant and vice versa in uh, people who are left-handed do we have any left-handed students or left-handed physicians in our group today dr Sam and who else okay so we have only some okay and then who else you okay what is your question, Dr. Hussein? You want to ask what? Do you know why people are right? Um, um, excuse me, Dr. Um, when, when ask uh, um, the lesion, where's the lesion when the eye uh, look to, what's lesion? You mean paralysis or uh, damage in the brain? Paralysis. Sorry, I'm confused here. Paralysis. Paralysis, okay. Paralysis, okay. okay. Um, if, if I look to the paralysis, side that yeah. um, that means BB, yeah. bbf yeah. bbf that is correct uh, yeah uh, if uh, uh, look to the brain uh, 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 um, sorry uh, mm -hmm. opposite side mm -hmm. opposite side that uh, frontal frontal okay. look right so so the best okay. thing don't think about uh, the brain okay the think about the thing which you will see as a physician as a doctor you can see that the left side the patient has a paralysis on one side okay if the patient uh, has the paralysis of the right side, then obviously the left side of the brain is damaged. So that is a given. Okay, so that is uh, that uh, calculation. Okay, so if you see that you have a patient who has right sided paralysis and you see that your patient is looking at the right side, then as a physician and as a doctor, you can you can conclude that your patient may have a paramedian pontine reticular formation damage. Okay. Okay. Is, is okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So that's what it is. And um Okay, so we have Dr. Hossam over here who is left-handed and and out of uh, 30 or 33 of us or, or do you see, do you read, do you guys read that majority of us are right-handed and uh, we have only one physician over here who is left-handed. So according to even smaller groups like us, okay, even like uh, smaller groups with us, even in our group, we have a majority of portion of people who are, who are right-handed, okay? And I do not know why majority of the people are right-handed, okay, but majority of the people are right-handed. Okay, so if, if there's a right-handed uh, person, then the left side of their brain is more dominant. And in the left-sided dominant brain, the parietal cortex, if that is damaged, what will happen is the patient will forget how to, uh, so this condition is known as Gerstmann syndrome. Gerstmann syndrome is basically agraphia, meaning they will, uh, they will uh, forget how to read, write, and draw. They will forget how to do mathematical calculations okay they will not be able to recognize their their fingers so this is known as finger agnosia and left right disorientation they will be enabled they will be unable to differentiate between left and between right and this syndrome is known as gerstmann syndrome gerstmann syndrome is basically so you will have a patient who has come to you with a sudden onset of difficulty in uh, performing uh, in performing simple tasks in a per, when you ask the patient to, to draw something, the patient will not be able to draw anything. Okay, if you ask the patient to draw a circle, the patient will just draw gibberish. Okay, I mean, will draw uh, absolutely uh, uh, nonsense things. Okay, and then you ask the patient to uh, identify which one of their fingers that you have touched. Let's say you touch the thumb, the patient will not be able to say which finger that you have touched. And if you ask the patient to go left, the patient will go right. The patient will not remember what left and right is. And this syndrome is known as Gerstmann syndrome. Okay, this syndrome is known as Gerstmann syndrome. This is a very interesting syndrome, and you might see a lot of these patients in your uh, clinical practice. Okay, okay. Next one. Next one is 
uh, if you have damage to your non-dominant parietal cortex, let's say you have damage to the non-dominant, let's say if you're a right-handed person, you're non-dominant. Let's say if you're a right-handed person, your dominant brain is left side. So obviously the non-dominant portion of your brain is the right side. And if you have damage to that right-sided brain, what will you have is you will have a condition that is known as hemispatial neglect syndrome. Hemispatial neglect syndrome, meaning that you will have complete unawareness of the contralateral side of the body or agnosia, meaning that you will not take into perception of the contralateral side of the world. So if you ask a patient to draw a circle, the, what the patient will draw is the patient will draw something like this, a half circle. Okay, this is extremely interesting. Let's say, let's say you ask the patient that, okay, uh, you have a very simple task. All you have to do is draw this circle, which I have drawn for you, okay? And if you give this patient the simple task, the patient will say, okay, it's very easy. And when the patient draws, you will see that the patient has drawn something which is incomplete. So this one side of the whole circle is missing. And this is known as hemispatial neglect syndrome. The patient will completely neglect and completely forget um, uh, which one did you get in your world? Which question did you get in your world about Gershman syndrome or about hemispatial neglect syndrome? Right. Okay, good. So you saw this condition, so you saw this condition in the hospital too. Okay. And obviously you will receive questions like this in your world all the time. Okay, so that's what it is. So this is known as non-dominant parietal cortex damage or hemispatial neglect syndrome. Next one. Next one is hippocampus. Hippocampus are the, uh, this is a part of your limbic system, right? We learn the limbic system by learning about the word hemet, okay, Hipp hippocampus. And what happens is if you have a hippocampal damage, if you have damage to your hippocampus, okay, what would happen is you will, ha you will have anterograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia, meaning that you will have difficulty in making new memories, okay? You will have difficulty in making new memories. So let's say, Let's say, God forbid, any one of you have a stroke today. Okay, God forbid, any one of you. Okay, so this is not the right thing to say. So God forbid, I have a stroke today. Okay, so I will not forget. I will not, uh, I will not remember that I taught you guys today. Okay, so this is an example. So let's say I'm teaching, I'm teaching you guys neurology, pathology, right? And when you ask me tomorrow, okay, uh, so Dr. Hydri, uh, what did we learn yesterday? And I will be completely blank. I will completely forget what, what we taught about. I will not be able to mention a single word. I will just look at you and just look really confused because I will try to figure out what's going on. And that look on my face and that everything that draws a picture in your mind and that picture of me is anterograde amnesia. Okay, so hippocampus. So it, that, that means I have a hippocampal damage. Okay, so this is really interesting. And if you have a patient, if you if you go to, to your neurology wards, okay, you will see a lot of these patients, okay? And the way you can uh, do this is, what would happen is, during a neurological exam, what, what you can do is, before you start the exam, before you start the exam, neurological exam, before you ask the patient the name, give the patient a simple task of remembering three words. Let's say you ask the patient that, okay, after the end of our examination, I will ask you whether you can remember the word red, blue, and yellow. Okay, only did these three words. And the patient will confidently tell you, yes, of course, I can remember the word red, blue, and yellow. And after you are done with your whole uh, examination, after let's say five minutes to six minutes, when you ask the patient, okay, do you remember uh, the three words which I, which I asked you to, to remember? And the patient will look at you extremely confused and scared, knowing that, no, I can't remember because um, he, he has a difficulty in forming new memories. Okay, and this is known as anterior grade amnesia. Okay, next one. Next one is a basal ganglia lesion, okay? Basal ganglia, okay? And we talked about the basal ganglia yesterday, how the basal ganglia has the direct pathway and the uh, basal ganglia has the indirect pathway, okay? And if the basal ganglia, if we have a lesion of the basal ganglia, the, the patient will get tremor, chorea, and atherosis because the basal ganglia is important for either decreasing or more increasing the movement, okay? And if we have damage to the basal ganglia, the patients will get tremor, chorea, and atherosis, okay? That is the basal ganglia lesion, okay? Next one. Next one is if you have a subthalamic nucleus damage, okay? Once again, the subthalamic nucleus is also involved for the proper functioning of the basal ganglia and the movement uh, disorders and in the proper coordination of movements. If you have a patient with a subthalamic nucleus, do you guys remember we talked about the subthalamic nucleus yesterday? 
we talked about the subthalamic nucleus. In which pathway is subthalamic nucleus used in the direct pathway or in the, in the indirect pathway? Indirect pathway. If you have the subthalamic nucleus, there will be improper functioning of the indirect pathway. And the patient can have a condition that is known as contralateral hemibalismus. Okay, contralateral hemibalismus. And I just want to take one minute to show you guys. Okay, contralateral hemibalismus. Okay, let me see if I can. Okay. See this patient over here? And then put your arms out in front. Good. Then down again. And try it with the left hand. Do you see this? Do you see the movement of, of, of her arm? Okay. okay, so this is really interesting. Okay, so this uh, movement is known as contralateral hemibalismus, meaning while flanging of the arm. Okay, did you guys see the video or was I the only one who saw this? Okay, good. Okay, good. So um, if you saw the video, then you have understood what the contralateral hemibalism, hemibalismus is. Okay, so it, this means that the patient has a subthalamic nucleus damage. Okay, subthalamic nucleus damage. Okay, and that's that. Okay, next one. Next one is mammillary bodies and mammillary bodies damage is associated with a very very um very very uh, famous syndrome this syndrome is known as warnicke's korsakoff syndrome warnicke's korsakoff syndrome and this is extremely important okay memory by mammillary body damage i cannot even stretch how many questions you will be receiving from uh, uh, mammillary body damage okay and uh, the reason why there is mammillary body damage is because we have a deficiency of a vitamin and who knows the name of that vitamin? Very, okay. So perhaps there is one of important knowledge uh, which you should have is, let's say you have a patient with long-term alcoholic uh, issues. Okay, the patient has a long-term alcoholic abuse history. If you treat the patient, if the patient comes to you with hypoglycemia, okay, and if you treat the, if you treat the patient with glucose, even before you infuse vitamin B1, okay? This will result in hemorrhagic necrosis of your mammillary body. Then the patient can instantaneously, instantaneously get Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome, okay? Because what will happen is when you infuse glucose in a, uh, in a patient who is an alcoholic, the vitamin B1 is, response, is highly important for the fact that it acts as a very important cofactor for the breakdown of uh, glucose, right? And what would happen is the, that this would result in uh, overactivity and stress of the mammillary bodies, and this would result in infarction and ischemia and, and necrosis of the mammillary body. So always remember next time, if you uh, work in your uh, ER, okay, meaning that if you are an ER physician or an, e or an emergency medicine physician, and if you have to deal with an alcoholic in the last third of your life, for some, because that's when you get your alcoholic patients, before you infuse any saline, okay, or glucose, make sure that you infuse the patient with vitamin B1 first. Make sure you infuse your patient with vitamin B1 first to prevent damage to the mammary bodies, okay? So if you have a patient with mammillary body damage, bilateral, this results in Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome. This is known as, this syndrome consists of confusion, ataxia, nystagmus, and ophthalmoplegia. Okay, so I'm pretty sure you guys are very, very familiar with Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome. Do we have one physician over here? Anyone who has never heard of Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome? Is there anyone here? Yes, no? Exactly, no. So there it is, okay? So everyone has heard about mammary body uh, damages, okay? So what would happen is you have a patient who is confused. The patient has uh, nystagmus. I'm pretty sure you guys know what nystagmus is, meaning that side-to-side uh, -side movement, involuntary side-to-side -side movement of the eyes. Ataxia, meaning difficulty in, uh, difficulty in coordinated movement and walking, okay? Along with this, the patient will also have memory loss, memory loss and confabulations and personality changes. Okay, so you guys know exactly what memory bodies. Please look out for 
these symptoms in your question. The question will come as if you have a patient who has a long history of alcohol abuse. Now the patient has come to you with, with difficulty in uh, forming new memories or cannot, cannot remember where he was. Along with this, the patient has personality changes, meaning that the patient was calm and composed before. Now the patient is highly aggressive. And now when you examine the patient, you see that the patient is walking in an uh, uncoordinated manner. The patient has side to side involuntary movement of the eyes. And what are you dealing with? You are unfortunately dealing with a patient who has Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see if you guys have understood. Okay, I'm pretty sure that there's no question. Okay, next one. Next one is amygdala. Amygdala, once again, is uh, another part of the limbic system. Okay, amygdala. Amygdala is, uh, amygdala damage is highly, highly indicated to one very important syndrome. This is known as kruver Busey syndrome. Okay, kruver Busey syndrome. Do we have any uh, physicians over here who is a big fan of watching House MD? House MD. House, have you watched House? Okay, we have the one Dr. Hassan, Dr. Karbasi, okay, Dr. Jordan. Okay, so if you guys watched House, I'm not sure if you guys remembered about one patient where they talked about with Kluver Busey syndrome in House. Okay, so Kluver Busey syndrome. Let me show you how the patients. So after you see the video, you will not forget what's happening over here. Okay, so it's a two minute video. This will help us. Um, understand Kluver Busey syndrome a bit better. Okay, so let's watch the video. Okay. So the first syndrome uh, for the first problem is hypersexuality. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Can you, can you guys see my video? Okay. So the first one which the patient will experience is hypersexuality. Okay. It's actually drug free now. I feel great, thanks to you. All part of the job. Question. Just been complete with a dormant neuro. Okay. A lot of damage. My wife's buying me a car. That girlfriend. It's Kluber Busey. His brain will melt down and try to swallow. The next one is hyper orality. So, what is hyper orality? Hyper orality is basically that uh, condition in which the patient speaks for uh, an abundant amount of time for no apparent reason, and the patient just speaks, just keeps on speaking and speaking. Okay, this is extremely uh, concerning for a patient who was who did not have a previous uh, personality. Okay, so a patient who has hyper orality is care that one. Okay. So, Any rationalization you had for basically, this is your patient, okay? So this is your patient, okay? So as, as, as you can see over here, what's happening is the the, the physician is trying to examine the patient and the patient just uh, tried to attack the physician. And this is a sign of hypersexuality. And that this is exactly what happens in a patient with Kluver Busey syndrome, in which if you have an amygdaloid lesion, you get hypersexuality, hyperorality, and there's another behavior problem. And this is known as hyperphagia, meaning that you keep on eat, you keep on eating a lot, okay? So there's increased amount of eating problems or eating, okay? This is what happens in a patient with an amygdaloid lesion or Kluver Busey syndrome. And the uh, virus that is associated or the condition that is associated with uh, amygdaloid lesion is HSV1 or herpes simplex virus 1 and cephalitis. And cephalitis, okay. Can anyone tell me which part of the lobe, uh, which, which lobe is affected by HSV1? Which is affected by HSV1? Which lobe is okay, it's temporal lobe. Okay. Okay, good. So in a in HSV1 lesion, you get in HSV1 lesion, you get an amygdaloid, uh, and you get fluber abuse syndrome. Okay. Next one. Next one is a dorsal midbrain lesion. Okay, next one is a dorsal midbrain lesion. Okay. In dorsal midbrain lesion, what you have is you have a condition which is known as perinol syndrome. You have a condition that is known as perinod syndrome. In perinod syndrome, the patients have, okay, this is also another thing which I want to show you guys with a video. This is a, okay, one second. Okay. One second. A couple of examples of perinod. Here we're asking the patient to Okay. So first of all, what the what the physician is doing is the physician is asking this asking the patient to move their eyes from side to side. Okay. Gaze laterally. 
so as the physician asks the patient to move the eyes side to side, the, the patient has no problem. Okay, but look what I happens next. Okay, wait for a while. Fairly smooth as well. Rapid refixation saccades appear normal. Mm -hmm. And now look what happens. Now we're asking the patient to look upward. Now he, the now the physician is doing uh, what the physician is doing is the physician is asking the patient to look upwards. Okay, so now look look what will happen when he does that. Okay. And notice that saccades in the up direction are certainly impaired, and in fact, you can see some convergence, retraction, and staggers. That's the other component of paranoid syndrome. Vertical gaze palsies, convergence, retraction, and stagmas, light near dissociation, cow in younger patients. Okay. So what happened was, did you guys realize that, that when the physician asked the patient to look from side to side, the patient could have moved his um, eyes. But when the physician asked the patient to look upward, the, the, the patient did not move their eyes from side to side. The, the patient only moved their, the, the patient had a nystagmus. Did you, did you guys notice the nystagmus? You guys notice the Okay, so this nystagmus, when the patient, when the physician asks the patient to move from side to side, this nystagmus over here, this is known as a vertical gaze. This is, this is known as a convergence retraction nystagmus. Okay, this nystagmus is known as a convergence retraction nystagmus. And the palsy, when the, page, when the physician asked the patient to look upwards, the, the patient could not look upwards, but the patient had no problem looking from side to side. And this condition is known as vertical gaze palsy. This condition is known as vertical gaze palsy, okay? Meaning that the patient has a problem looking upwards. Next one is lid, ret lid retraction, okay? So the lids are retracted. So meaning that the patients have lit retracted lid, eyelids, and the, the patients have pupillary light near dissociations, okay? So the light near, so we have uh, four big problems. One of them is vertical gaze palsy. Next one is convergence retraction nystagmus. Next one is lid retraction and pupillary light near dissociation. Okay. And the conditions that are associated with the dorsal midbrain lesion are stroke, hydrocephalus, and, and, uh, and the benign uh, brain tumor known as penealoma or tumors of the pineal gland. Okay. Does anyone have any idea which uh, cranial nerve is affected in a dorsal midbrain lesion? Dorsal midbrain lesion. Which cranial nerve is affected? Has anyone heard of dorsal midbrain lesion before? CN10 is vagus nerve. I highly doubt uh, dorsal midbrain lesion is, uh, CN10 is affected in dorsal midbrain lesion. Anyone else? Anyone else? Very good. So it's uh, CN3, okay. So thank you, Dr. A Dr. Adenom for contributing and Dr. Hassan for also contributing and seeing my answer. Okay, so it's the third thing you learn. Okay, so CN3, okay. So ocular motor nerve is associated with the dorsal midbrain lesion. Okay, there's that. Okay, next one. Next one is our friend over here, reticular activating system, which we have already discussed before. And we talked about the fact how the reticular activating system is associated with coma. Okay, reticular, uh, reticular activating system, it is associated with coma. Okay, this is, this is important. Okay, now, now it's getting easier. Next one is your cerebellar hemisphere damage. And you, we talked about the fact that how, this, how the cerebellum has two parts. It has the vermis and it has the hemispheres. And the hemispheres of the cerebellum, they're important for, the, for proper co uh, coordinated movement of the limbs. Okay, And if you have a damage of the cerebellar hemisphere, what will happen is the patient will have tremor, ataxia, and loss of balance. Okay, And if you have uh, damage to the vermis, the, the, the same things will happen, but the, but the things will happen in the trunk. In the trunk portion, so there will be trunk ataxia and nystagmus. So midline, so midline damage. Okay, meaning that damage of the movement disorders of so the trunks and the eyes and hemispheric damage will result in movement disorders of the extremities. Okay, next one is red nucleus or midbrain. Okay, now this is a bit important. You have to understand uh, what is decorticate posturing and decerebrate posturing. Okay. So red nucleus is a nucleus in your midbrain, okay? So what happens is uh, if you have a lesion above the red nucleus, okay? Let me see if I can get up with a proper diagram. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this nucleus, as you can see over here in the midbrain, okay, this is a midbrain, okay? And uh, this is the red nucleus. 
Okay, so if you have damage of uh, the structures of the midbrain above the red nucleus, what would happen is you would have a condition which is known as decorticate posturing. And what is decorticate posturing? This is a, this is a damage in which there is flexion of upper extremities and extensions of lower extremities, meaning that the patient will have, let's say if the patient is lying down, this is your patient who is lying down on the bed, and the patient has, let's say, the, the legs are straight, but for some reason the patient has flexed upper limbs. The patients have a flexed upper limbs, okay? So the, the two limbs of the patient and the, the limbs of the patient are flexed, and this is known as decorticate posture. Next one is if there's a lesion of the red nucleus below, if there's a lesion of the midbrain below the red nucleus, below the red nucleus, they will have extension of both. So meaning that over here, what would happen is the patient, patient will have, the patient will just lie down straight. Patient will just lie down straight. And when you ask the patient to flex their knees, and when you ask the patient to flex their arms, they will not be able to flex their arms or flex their knees. And this type of posturing is known as D cerebrate posturing, D cerebrate posturing or extensor posturing. And then this one is known as a D corticate posturing. Okay. So that's that. Okay. With that being said, we have learned about all the lesions of the brain. Okay. We have learned about all the lesions of the brain. And if you think that we are going to move forward without solidifying this information, then you are absolutely wrong. So what we are going to do is Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys how long? Um, I will give you guys no more than five minutes. Okay. I will give you guys no more than five minutes. And during that five minutes, I want to hear what will happen as a consequence of the lesion or the names of the lesion. I want you guys to solidify this information right away. Right away, because I have just discussed every single topic word by word. Okay. And I would expect you guys to learn it right now okay because why because the rest of your days should be focused if you were planning on learning about this later after the lectures and not doing your question that's not going to happen okay you guys will do your question then and you guys will learn the text now okay no more than five minutes it's 1209 and i will ask in 1214 can you repeat the red nucleus is basically uh the gray matter in the midbrain and what's happening is that the red nucleus uh, this condition is known as uh, red nuclear damage. Okay, so if you have a red nuclear damage, there is a posturing problem. The midbrain is important because for transferring of all the uh, tracts properly. If you have lesions above the red nucleus, the patients will have decorticate posturing, meaning that they reflection of the upper arms and extension of the lower arms. And if the patients have uh, lesions below the red nucleus, they will have these cerebrate posturing. These cerebrate posturing is basically extensions of the upper and lower arms. Okay. So that's what is going to happen. And, okay, how many doctors will I need to participate with me today? One, two, three, four. Okay, so five doctors would do. Okay, five doc ask. Am I all asking is five patients or five doctors will help me? I could not look at this, ask them. Okay, help me understand that I have solidified the information or not. Okay, so who is ready in five minutes? Please write ready. And I will start the small revision and test. Okay, so you guys get exactly five minutes. Okay, so whoever is done, please let me know. I'm, I'm over here. Uh, this is not like I'm, I gave you a task and I went for a break myself. Okay, so do, so do not worry, I'm over here. Just waiting for you guys to be done.
Okay, Dr. Hassan, thank you. Let's wait for some other physicians too. Please, we would need the participations of three or four more physicians, please. I, I insist, please participate in the participations so that we can know that you have, we have certified that information. Okay, Dr. Mahatwari, thank you. Two more, Dr. Iman, thank you. Two more doctors. Dr. Ibrahim, thank you. Another doctor, please. Okay, Dr. Yusuf, thank you so much. Okay, so we have five doctors over here and we, we don't want to waste any more time. The rest of you guys, please uh, keep an eye on the discussion. Okay, so let's start with our favorite Dr. Hassan, who always participates with us. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. If you can unmute yourself, with that, that will be great. Yes, doctor, I unmuted myself and ready. Okay, so what is the, would you be kind enough to tell me, uh, what is the consequence you would be looking for in your patient who has a frontal lobe damage? Um, there would be disinhibitions, uh, uh, like no what concentration. Yes? What tasks can the patient not perform? Ah, like what we ask him to perform? No, no, no. Um, what? How will the patient look like? What will the patient? What are the problems of the patient who has a frontal lobe lesion? Yeah, like he will be jumping from um, speech to speech to another speech, like. Okay, so he is not. In, yeah, changing beh uh, behavioral changing. Okay. Personality Good. change. If you ask him to make a decision, will he be able to make a decision? Uh, no. Okay, good. So he, he will have disinhibition and deficits in his judgment calls. Okay, good. So very good. Next one is, if you have a patient who has a frontal eye field lesion, will he look towards the side of paralysis or away from the side of paralysis? Uh, away. Very good. Away. If you have a patient with parapontine reticular damage formation, will he look away or towards the side of paralysis? Uh, toward the side very of paralysis. Okay, if you have a patient who has difficulty looking side to side with one eye, okay, what is the, what is the name of the condition? Uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Okay, what is the disease associated with internuclear uh, With the, Associated with medial longitudinal fasciculosis, it's like uh, uh, multiple, multiple sclerosis. MS. Multiple sclerosis, that's correct. And the last question is, okay, so I will move on to the next physician. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hassan, for performing. Yeah, Next, next one is Dr. Mahatri. Yes. Uh, would you be kind enough to please tell us what do you expect to find in a patient who has a dominant parietal cortex damage? There will be uh, agraphia, acalculia, and okay. left to right disorientation. Okay, and what is the name of the syndrome? Gersman syndrome. Gersman syndrome, very good. What is the name of uh, the condition or the syndrome in which the patient has a damage to the non dominant parietal cortex? Sorry, uh, name of the condition. Name of the condition in which the patient has a damage to the non-dominant parietal cortex. It is hemispatial neglect syndrome. Perfect. And the next one is, if you have a patient who has come to you with problems in forming new memories, what is the part of the brain that is damaged? Hippocampus. Very good. And the last one is, if you have a patient who has uh, basal ganglia damage, okay? What are yes. the movement disorders you expect to see in your patients? Uh, there can be tremors, chorea, and acetosis. Perfect, thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Next, one. Next one goes to Dr. Iman, okay? Uh, yes. uh, Dr. Iman, would you be kind enough to tell us um, what is the name of the syndrome that occurs in a mammillary body damage? Mammillary body? Um, yes. What are the things to look out for in a war course of syndrome? What are the symptoms? Uh, confusion, anastagmus, uh, ophthalmoblegia. 
Okay. And? Sorry, I didn't hear you good. Okay, I'm, my apologies. Your voice is breaking. Okay, my question was how, okay, is my voice okay now? Yeah, I, th okay. I think so. <laughs> okay, so my question was, what do you expect to find in Warnicke's course of quality? You have said confusion in the segments and what else? Of salmoplegia. And? Uh, memory loss. Memory loss. Also um, personal exchange. Very good. Okay, next one. Next one is if you have a patient with uh, Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome, uh, how do you be patient in an immune department who has uh, hypoglycemia? Do you get glucose before you want to be water? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you hear me now? It's breaking. Okay, can you guys hear my voice now? Is the voice clear? Yeah, it's good. Okay, perfect. So let's start with Dr. Iman once again. And my question was, um, Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome. If you have a patient with Warnicke's Korsakoff syndrome in the emergency department and with hypoglycemia, will you treat the patient with B1 before glucose or glucose before B1? Yeah, I have to give him thiamine first. Right. And then glucose, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Iman, for that answer. Next one is, uh, we had uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, uh, who wanted to perform too. And what is the name of the syndrome that you see in a dorsal midbrain lesion, Dr. Hussein? Yes, uh, Baranoid syndrome. Oh, oh, okay, so it was Dr. Ibrahim, I'm sorry. Okay, so the uh, name of the syndrome is Paranoid syndrome, very good. And what are the things to look out for in a patient with Paranoid syndrome? And there is a uh, hypersexuality and showing in personality. No, that's Kluver Busey syndrome. Paranoid uh, syndrome. Abaranoid uh, syndrome. Vertical gaze. Very good. Vertical gaze policy and then what else? Sorry? What else? Vertical gaze policy and then what else do you see in paranoid syndrome? And uh, okay, so you also see pupillary light near dissociation, lid retraction, and convergence with retraction is nystagmus. Is that what you wanted to say? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so great answer. The voice is uh, breaking for me. Yeah. Oh, the voice is breaking. Okay. Is the voice clear now? A little bit, yeah. Okay, good. What is the name of the condition in which you have red damage to the reticular activating system? Uh, there is a loss of consciousness and uh, internal deep coma. Very good. Okay. Who was the another fit? Who was the another doctor? So thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Who was the another physician who wanted to perform? Yes, Mazar. After Dr. Was Dr. Ibrahim, who was the another physician who wanted? To, okay, so it was Dr. Yusuf, I guess. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yes. Mazar Yusuf. Okay. Okay, good. Yes. So uh, my question to you is, what is the name of the lesion that occurs uh, in amygdaloid? I mean, what is the name of the syndrome that occurs in amygdaloid lesion and lesion of the uh, amygdala? Yes, this is Clover Busy syndrome. Very good. It's, it's Clover Busey syndrome. And the things to look out for, what are the things that you have to look out for in a patient with Clover Busey syndrome? 
yes, there will be an uh, inhibited, uh, disinhibited behavior. Uh, so we noticed hyperphagia or hypersexuality or hyperorality. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, my last question to you is, uh, if you have a patient who has damage to the red nucleus above the red nucleus, what is the name of the posturing? Uh, decorticate. And below the red nucleus, what is the name of the posturing? Decerebrate. Decerebrate is below. Very good. At or below. Very good. It's at or below. And thank you for specifying that. Okay, so it's at or below the red nucleus. And I have not mentioned that, but you did. Looks like you have read the whole thing perfectly. Thank you so much. Okay, so the answer is decerebrate uh, posturing. And thank you so much to Dr. Hassam, Dr. Maheshwari. Dr. Ibrahim, uh, Dr. Hussein, and Dr. Yusuf uh, for performing. And uh, also thank you to the rest of the physicians who have also took their time to learn this whole thing out. Okay, okay. Please do not, um, please do not uh, get annoyed by the fact when I ask you guys to learn the tables right away. The reason why I want you guys to do this right now is because once again, please, I want you guys to use the rest of your day solving your old question. That's the reason why I asked the questions and to make sure that you guys have learned the knowledge from over here. Okay, with that being said, it's 12.23 as of right now. Would you guys be interested in uh, stopping the U, uh, first aid over here and starting with the U world notes? Okay, All right. Okay, I, I think we have studied enough for today with the first aid. Okay, so let's stop over here and let's start with the U world notes, okay. Okay, perfect. And with that being said, okay, uh, a lot of you might leave right now, okay, because a lot of you do not like staying in the UL mode, but uh, I would insist you guys on staying, okay? I would insist you guys on staying so that you guys can discuss the UL notes with us. Okay, this will help you guys solve the UL questions. Okay, one second, please. Okay. One second. Okay. So can you guys see my screen over here? Quite a bit of looks in the last one month. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Yes or no? Perfect. Okay, so feel free to um, <clears throat> feel free to once again unmute yourselves and um, try to participate and answer questions associated with the discussion, okay? Because what this will do is this will allow me to focus more on the notes and going back to the chat to see who is answering what. Okay. okay. One second, one last second, please. Okay. Okay, so are you guys ready? Do you want to begin? Yes or no? Is everyone ready? Okay, perfect. Okay, let's start. Okay. Okay. So if you have a young patient, young patient who has come to you, young patient with uh, four mats on the left side of the neck, left side of the neck of a child and the neck is and the neck is stiff neck is stiff but the patient does not have a fever okay, with no fever okay what is the diagnosis differential diagnosis brachial cleft cyst i'm sorry what was the brachial cleft cyst anything else 
Cystic hygroma. Which one? Cystic hygroma. Cystic hygroma. Okay, so you guys are thinking about masses. Okay, you guys are thinking about tumors. But how? But uh, if if a patient has a tumor on the neck, such as cystic hygroma, or uh, or like anything else, or a branchial cleft cyst, this will not hamper the patient in moving the neck. Okay, the patient can still move the neck. The neck will not be stiff. Why is the neck stiff and there's a firm mass on palpation and the patient has no fever even though this neck is, neck is stiff. Meaning the patient does mass not have muscles related to... Ternocleidomastoid. Ternocleidomastoid, like... Corticolysis. Okay, did anyone say... Corticolysis. Corticolysis. Yeah. The condition is known as infantile torticollis. Torticollis. Okay, look out for this question in Ambos and U World. Okay, very important. Next one. Next one is if you have a young patient with unilateral, unilateral. Okay, one second. Young patient with unilateral testicular, unilateral testicular pain, sterile pyuria. What do you uh, what do, what do you think this is the what, what uh, infection do you think the patient has young patient with a unilateral testicular pain and sterile pi pyuria mumps maybe no it's not mumps mumps the mumps no. gonorrhea the patient does not have parotid swelling the patient only Tuber has a... tuberculosis. tuberculosis maybe testicular Gem torsion Gem Gem cells, no. testicular torsion is not the right answer tuberculosis is not the right answer uh, but thank you so much for trying. Unilateral testicular pain with sterile pyuria. First of all, if a patient has a unilateral testicular pain, what is the name of the condition? Oh, maybe a varicocele or varicocele. Varicocele, yeah. No, because there is no swelling of the testicles. So it's not a varicocele. Okay? Uh, there's, no, there's not a bag of warm appearance of the testicles. So it's not very good. Okay, so anyone who said acute epididymitis, acute epididymitis. Okay, okay. This is a okay. Acute epididymitis. Okay, this is um, this this is a very difficult for me to pronounce perfectly all the time. So I, I end up saying acute epididymitis. Acute epididymitis. Okay. Okay, so what is the organism that is responsible for acute epididymitis? Organism? You two? Anyone? Mm. Okay, no one. How about now? Chlamydia. Chlamydia. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure you guys knew about this before. You guys were just waiting for me to write CHI. Okay, so you guys knew about this. Sometimes you guys like to hide your knowledge. Okay. okay, next one. Next one is, if you have a patient who has come to you with Wegener's granulomatosis. If you guys have a patient who comes to you with Wegener's granulomatosis, what is the name of the antibody that is present in a patient with Wegener's granulomatosis? C. Anka. C. Anka. C. Anka. And CNK stands for cytoplasmic anti nucleus um, cytoplasmic antibody. Okay. Um, and uh, can you guys specify which enzyme is uh, the antigen and what is the antibody working against? Uh, Metalloproteinase. No. Nope. Nice try, but thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. Anything else? Okay. No one. Hopefully not. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't you, not give you guys enough time. Yes. Neutrophil. Cytoplasm. Okay, next one. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you guys know about this. You guys are just tired from the lecture today. That's why you guys cannot remember the things. Okay. I believe you guys know about this. Next one. Next one is if you have a patient with gray or white vagina, vaginal discharge. Okay. And the patient has a positive. With MI test, 
on potassium hydroxide peak. What is the diagnosis? Angan. Gardenella. 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 Vaginalis. What cells do you expect to find in a patient with guard? Blue cell. Blue cells. Blue cells. You have a clue, and the clue is the blue cells. Okay. Next one. Okay. Okay. Next one. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. So once again, so I have come across a question in which they have asked you that you have a patient who has had nightmares. Which part of the stage of sleep is the nightmare occurring? N3. N3. Three. N3. Nightmare. Me, uh, REM. Uh, REM. 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 So do you guys, did you guys realize I warned you guys before? Okay. N3 yeah. would be nightmares. Okay. I warned you guys before that you guys were yeah. confused about this. And okay. So the reason why I am going to repeat this is because in the actual exam, under that much stress, you guys will get confused again. Okay, so please do not get confused on nightmares and night terrors. Night terrors are not the ones which are occurring in REM sleep. Nightmares are occurring in REM sleep. Okay, so I wrote this question down because um, this question was asked at least five times in MBOSS. Okay, so anyone who's uh, solving MBOSS, um, you guys will receive this question. Okay, next one. Next one is, um, okay, one second. Okay, procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is an acute phase reactive protein. Procalcitonin, okay. Procalcitonin, does it rise in bacterial infection or fall in bacterial infection? Rise. It's rise, especially in kidney infection. How about in viral infection? Does it rise or does it fall? Increase, yes, we fall. Does it rise or fall? False. Maybe. Fall in viral Okay, why is this happening? I have, I, I have uh, no clue. Uh, if I have to be really honest, I have not looked into this. Okay, this is just a knowledge or which I received. And um, I'm just sharing it with you guys. If you guys receive these type of questions in, in the future, try to look out for the viral or bacterial infection and then answer accordingly. Okay, why is this happening? I'm not sure. Okay, okay. Okay, one second. Next one, next one is? Okay, the next one is a bit important. Okay, so RNA polymerase one. RNA polymerase one, what are the ribosomes that are, which ribosome is responsible, well, which ribosome is formed from RNA polymerase one? RNA, ribosomal uh, RNA. Okay, ribosomal RNA, that is a good answer. Thank you so much. And what are the types of ribosomal RNA that is formed from RNA polymerase one? Okay, the answer is 14S. Yeah, 23. Yeah. Then, 3.8S, and then 20S. Ribosomal yeah. RNA. Next one. Next one is if you have a patient, I mean, if you have RNA polymerase, what are the RNAs that are produced from ribosome RNA polymerase? Mm -hmm. Transferal RNA. Which um, one? mRNA. Um, um, mRNA and microRNA. And? And? SNRNA. Uh, SRNA. Okay. Next one. If you have a patient with RNA polymerase 3. Okay, and the question is asking you what is responsible. What what for what what are the structures from RNA polymerase three? What is your answer? T RNA. T RNA. Five And five point five five S ribosomal RNA. Five S. And maybe S H N R N A. S N R N A is produced by RNA polymerase two. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. The next one. Okay, another one. Okay. The appearance of dust. Appearance of dust from the lungs. Okay. okay. I'm going to, going to talk about the clearance of dust of the lungs. Okay. So, 
which cells are involved for clearing the dust of the lungs? Alveolar macrophages. Macro macrophage. Let me you know. Hear this out. Upper terminal bronchioles. In there. What Celia. is the answer? Celia. Okay. The answer is ciliated columnar cells. And next one is from respiratory bronchial <laughs> alveoli. Macrophages. What is your answer? Macrophage. Not macrophage. Macrophage. So be specific about what the question is asking you. If the question is asking you upper terminal bronchial, your answer should be ciliated columnar cells. And if it's more than uh, respiratory bronchial to the alveoli, your answer should be um, uh, your answer should be alveolar macrophage. Next one. If you have nerve nerve damage, which nerve damage in the pyriform recess? If you have nerve damage in the pyriform recess, what is the name of the nerve that will get damaged? Pen. Vagus nerve. What? Which? What is the name? Olfactory, maybe. Pen. Pen. Oh, no. Okay, so the doctor who said internal laryngeal nerve, he is absolutely correct. Um. Name of the nerve. The internal nerve. Okay. And which limb, uh, which reflex will not work? Oh. Which cranial reflex will not work? Biphonic? There will be, no. There will be a loss of efferent limb of cough reflex. Okay, cough reflex will not work. Internal laryngeal nerve, which nerve gives rise to internal laryngeal nerve? The superior laryngeal nerve. Okay, so we will keep this question open and then we will come back to this question because there's another question associated with it. So we'll wait for a minute. Okay, trypsine. Okay. Trypsine is secreted as trypsinogen. That is not the question. Okay, okay. So who activates trypsine? What is the name of the enzyme? What was the name of the enzyme? Enterokinase. Enteropeptase. Enteropeptase. And the name of the enzyme is enteropeptase. Okay. Enteropeptase. Enteropeptidase. The name of the enzyme. Okay. Next one. Next one is. One second, please. If you have a patient in which INR is increased, so increased INR with warfarin treatment, what are the conditions in which the INR can increase in a patient who has been treated with warfarin? Uh, cytochrome, cytochrome oxidase inhibition. Very good. So decrease cytochrome P450. Then? Vitamin K. Uh, vitamin K, very good. Decrease vitamin K, very good. And decrease. Another one. Intestinal bacterial gut flora. Very good. Perfect. Okay, intestinal flora. Okay. Okay. Have you guys heard of the test RT PCR? RT PCR. Have you guys heard of this test? Yes. Mm -hmm. Reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. What does it detect? CDNA. Which one? Retroviral, maybe. It detects mRNA. Okay. Always remember this. This is a high yield question for you, you world. Okay. You will be asked about this over and over and over again at least eight times. Eight times. Okay. So. RT-PCR is responsible for detecting mRNA. How does this happen? We will discuss about this in detail when we study genetics. Okay, next one. Okay, what are the carcinomas detected by alpha fetoprotein? HCC. HCC and? Testicular. Seminoma. Seminoma. Germ okay. cell. Okay, if you have a patient with CA19.9, what is the... What pancreatic, 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 
pancreatic carcinoma. Next one is if you have a patient with CA125, what can you detect? Ovarian. Uh, ovarian. Ovarian. Ovarian carcinoma. And ovaries have O and one have <coughs> one have O. Oh, next one. Is if you have a patient with um, CEA positive, carcinoembryonic antigen positive, what, what can you detect? Uh, intestinal colon, colon cancer, yeah, colonic, colonic carcinoma, colonic carcinoma, colonic and pancreatic, maybe. Okay, so basically gastrointestinal carcinoma. Okay, very good. Next one is if you have a patient with uh, HCG, high HCG, and you suspect carcinoma, what can you detect? Uh, seminoma, no, 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 no. yeah, uh, polar, uh, molar, uh, molar, tumors. molar, <laughs> correct, yeah. carcinoma, yeah, correct, carcinoma, yeah. PSA? Prosthetic carcinoma. Have you guys heard about Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, the book? Yes. yes. Okay. Who, who was the physician who said yes? Who said yes? Who was the physician who said yes, please? Who has heard about the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 book? Yes, M5. Yes, I have. Four. Okay, so I just I just, just want to know who the who the physician is, Doctor. Okay, so have you guys? Okay, so the reason why I'm asking you guys is because um, this shows that you guys have been reading books which are very very uh, advanced. Okay, so that's very good. And Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 book is associated with a rich group of illness. Mental illnesses. Right, so psychiatric illness. So that's very good. And if, uh, if so, so can can you guys tell me uh, what are the DSM five anxiety disorders? DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. What are the anxiety disorders of DSM five? This is really this is a very high yield question for Ambas. Okay, they want to know what are the DSM five uh, anxiety disorders. Okay, so I don't okay. want to put pressure on you guys. Okay, the uh, answer is at first we have. General anxiety disorder. Next one is we have specific phobias. Okay, if you guys are solving AMBO, then this is for you. Next one is panic disorder. Next one is social anxiety disorder. Okay, and we will discuss in details about DSM-5 criteria for a variety of disorders in the next chapter, which we will study, that is uh, psychiatry. Okay, next one. Okay, so very good guys who are studying DSM-5. That's good on you. Okay, now let's talk about another psychiatric uh, psychiatric condition. Have you guys heard about behavior conditioning? Yeah. Anyone? Behavioral, behavioral conditioning. Okay, so uh, can anyone tell me Okay, so you guys have not heard, you guys have not heard about the behavior conditioning. So we will skip out on this, okay? And I will discuss about this when we learn psychiatry. Okay, so I will move forward. Okay, okay this is a very, this is a very interesting question. Okay, so during sleep apnea, during obstructive sleep apnea, during obstructive sleep apnea, okay? Okay, during obstructive sleep apnea, is uh, which nerve can you stimulate for increased forward movement of the tongue? Uh, Genioglos uh, hypoglossus. Okay, so if you have a patient with obstructive sleep apnea and you stimulate hypoglossal nerve, this will result in forward movement of the tongue. And this will result in increased anteroposterior diameter, anteroposterior diameter of the tongue. And as a result, what would happen is you will get increase, you will get a relief of sign symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, next one. Next one is, if you treat up in bronchial asthma, in bronchial asthma, if you treat the patient with corticosteroids, if 
you treat the patient with corticosteroid, this will decrease inflammation, okay? Okay, which receptors will be upregulated when, when you treat a patient with corticosteroids? NKFCB. Which one was it? Okay, so there will be upregulation of B2 receptor. Okay, next one. Next one is, what are the causes of acute hypocalcemia? Go. Number one. Guys? It could be surgery, uh, thyroid surgery. That's very good. Next, next surgery or thyroid surgery, very good. Next. Maybe pancreatitis. Very good. Okay, the exact answer was pancreatitis. Next. Okay, I will provide one. Tumor lysis syndrome. Oh. Okay, next. Last one. Maybe chronic kidney diseases or chronic yeah. kidney disease. Renal failure. Renal, Renal failure. failure. Chronic. And another one. Chelators. Ah, oh, chelators. Okay. Okay, next one. Okay. Okay, next one. If you have a patient with bilateral renal angiomyolipoma, if you have a patient with bilateral renal angiomyolipoma, which neurocutaneous disorder do you think that this patient has? Okay. Or something. Okay, can you guys give me one second, please? Yes. So can you guys hear my voice? Can you guys hear my voice? Guys, are you guys there? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, so this is uh, another thing that you can see is brain hematomas are also present. Okay, next one. Okay. Next one is, if you have a patient uh, with spinal stenosis, if you have a patient with spinal stenosis, okay, if you have a patient with spinal, with spinal stenosis, uh, which, which ligament will undergo hypertrophy to cause, that, to cause that stenosis? There's a ligament which will undergo hypertrophy after which the patient will get spinal stenosis. Okay, there will be hypertrophy of. Yes, you're almost there. It's on the anterior side. I can't. I don't. Okay, unfortunately, the answer is. Answer is. Ligamentum planum. Very good. The answer is ligamentum planum. Very good. Okay. In spinal stenosis, there's hypertrophy of the ligamentum planum. 
Next one. Okay. 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 Which amino acid is most abundant in collagen? Glycine. Very good, Dr. Hassan. Hoping that was you. Okay. And okay. Next one is uh, okay. Okay. So, what are the cells? Cells that synthesize that synthesize collagen. Fibroblasts. Thank you. Fibroblasts. Okay, doctors, thank you so much. Okay, who was that other doctor who who said the answer? Lazar. Okay, thank you so much, doctor, for saying that. Okay, what are the two other cells that are involved? Uh, other than fibroblast, osteoblast, and maybe chondroblast also. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. 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 Good. Very good. So it's fibroblast, osteoblast, and chondroblast, and these are the three cells that are responsible for synthesizing the collagen. Okay. Next one. Next one is. Okay, so what happens? Uh, okay, so another one is in psychiatric illness. Okay, in psychiatric illness, what are the dissociative disorders? Dissociative disorders in which the patient is dissociated from their own uh, physical, in their own, from their own mental environment. Dissociative disorders. Anyone? Number one. Hallucination. Oh. Dissociative amnesia. Dissociative disorder. Okay, that's a good one. So thank you so much. That, that, this, I'm pretty sure you said dissociative, dissociative identity disorder. Yeah. And uh, derealization and depersonalization. Perfect. It's a depersonalization. Personalization. Thank you so much. Okay. So these are the ones, okay, which you should look out for. Okay, next one. Next one is, okay, what, which drug do we use in opioid intoxication? Naloxone. Naloxone. Uh, okay. Which drug do we use for opioid withdrawal? Methadone. Very good. Okay. Why do we use methadone in withdrawal? Because it have it, it has uh, more exactly. uh, duration of action and less yeah. affinity and addiction. It has a longer half-life. Okay. The half-life is longer. So that's why we use it in uh, opioid uh, withdrawals. Okay. Okay. Next one. Last one. Vascular calcifications. What are the conditions in which you can see vascular calcifications? Anyone? What are the conditions in which you can see vascular calcifications? Number one. Atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis. Okay, so atherosclerosis. I wanted to write something else. That for number two, atherosclerosis, and that's number one. Thank you guys. And then hyper hypercalcemia, calcemia, hyperphosphatemia, phosphatemia. Mm. Next one, chronic kidney diseases. No, it's chronic inflammation. Okay, so chronic inflammation. Okay, so that's all. That's that. Okay, so um, that's that. Okay, so thank you so much for doing the U World notes. Okay, uh, you guys would not believe this, but we are actually really close to finishing the U World notes. Okay, uh, hopefully by this month we will be done with the entire U World notes. So um, that's one thing. Okay. Excuse uh, me. Can you just show for one yeah. more time the U World notes, uh, like mm -hmm. the last. One thing, the last side. No, 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 down, down, down. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, so the U World notes will be completed in a month. Okay, hopefully by the next month they will be completed, and uh, that's that. Okay. So with that being said, um, okay. So what I would like to do for today is I would like to skip out on doing the questions. Is that okay? Okay. 
Is that okay? You, yes, I will post it on the group. Uh, once again, thank you so much for participating for today's discussion on UL Note. Uh, is it okay if we skip out on doing the five questions for today and we can do, let's say, extra 10 questions tomorrow? That way we can recover. Guys, is that okay? Okay. Okay, good. So if that is okay, then I would like to take my leave because uh, I have an emergency call and I would like to go and attend that. And uh, since it's already 1 p.m., I was thinking of un of ending that. We usually end our lectures at 1.20 or 1.25, but today we are ending the lecture 20 minutes before and, and I will make it up tomorrow by doing 20 minutes extra. Okay. So um, that's that. Okay, so if that's what it is, thank you so much for doing today's lecture. We have successfully covered a lot of neural, neurology, physiology. Okay, so please, if you guys like our lectures and if you guys like our teaching skills and if there's anything that you would like us to know, please leave, leave us a feedback on our page. And you are welcome, Dr. Ahmed Adhanom, Dr. Evelyn, Dr. Nikki Youssef, Dr. Hussein, Dr. Barbasi, Dr. Otero. Okay, you guys are all welcome. And I want to thank you too for putting your utmost attention uh, during the lecture. Okay, and uh, hopefully by this week or by the starting of the next week, we will complete neurology with confidence. Okay, let me know if you guys have any questions. In the meantime, uh, I know a lot of you are waiting for uh, the videos. Okay, uh, it was taking us some time, but we will be. Um, we, we will be uploading the videos as soon as possible, okay? So that's that. And uh, if you have any friends who do need help with the lectures or preparing for step one, please let them know that we're there for them. If they want to do one uh, day of free classes, uh, they can come and attend our one day of free class. Okay, so that's what it is. And uh, hopefully you guys have a great day today. And uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay, thank you.